This podcast is created for adult audiences only and contains content that may be alarming to some viewers. Listener discretion is advised. Any badass views or opinions you're about to hear are those of the hosts that do not represent those of the people, institutions, or organizations that the podcast may or may not be associated with. So just don't be a dick. You know what you're getting yourself into. Hello everyone, welcome to Girls Gone Weird. I am Denny. And I am Nicole. And welcome to our seventh episode. We're really excited. Yes, thanks for sticking with us. And I just wanted to ask to everybody else, uh, because I'm sure people are wondering how you're doing, because you made it public that you had surgery this week. I did. I am one of those very lucky people that had a doctor listen to me, and I got my uterus taken out. Whoop, so. Whoop. I'll tell you the whole situation that's going on right near here. I am laying down in bed fully. I am wearing, I don't know if anyone knows someone who's been pregnant or had this type of surgery, but I'm fully wearing one of those diapers. Oh, um, yeah, they, baby. Yeah, they're like elastic diapers, like a big pad, so they make your ass look great and everything. And when you sit down, it crunches. <laughs> <laughs> that's even sexier. The crunch. It's like crunch. Yep, the crunch. Look at that and it makes crunchy your butt look ass. <laughs> it is. So I had a crunchy X. Uh, you're going to see I'm going to make up a lot of words today because I'm a little bit on Oxy and a little bit on some CBD and THC today. You know what? I am totally okay with that because because of this, it's going to make editing easier for me because I ain't going to edit out a lot of your shit this episode because you're on <laughs> just drugs. Just let it flow. I'm just, just going to let, let it, it flow. flow just because yeah. everybody wants to hear that anyway. I'm living my best life right now. I've never taken Oxycontin. Anyone that knows me, including Nicole, knows I don't ever, like, all my other surgeries have been kind of anti, like, taking pain meds. You have. And, like, this time I'm like, I need them, and it's doing great. But you know what? Just Surprisingly, I'm, I'm like, I thought I'd be, like, a lightweight because I have mm -hmm. not taken anything like that. Super heavyweight. Like, even the doctor's really? surprised. Yeah, yeah. Like, it doesn't do much for me. Like, I have to take a lot of them interesting so, weird right i can yeah. take cough medicine and i can't even drive a car so oxy's <laughs> like nah yep oxy's it i <laughs> no guess no problems <laughs> well no problem thank you for hanging with us while you're all woozy yeah maybe i'll have a better we time this time it. it's the way to go <laughs> but it's funks it's nicole centric and i don't even know what the topic is today it's a surprise to me i was gonna ask if you've cheated at all and looked at our notes i've absolutely not like i've accidentally nicole and i share notes and i have purposely been avoiding them so <laughs> all right so it's a total surprise do you have any guesses I was thinking it's either going to be maybe about aliens, or I know we talked about past lives last episode, so I was thinking maybe something like that, because I know okay, you're really interested okay. in doing that. So am I close? Okay. Uh, you're slightly close, I guess. Yeah. I guess my first question will reveal the answer. Are you ready All for right. it? What is it? Where do you stand on reincarnation and past lives? Ooh, Boom, you got it. Reinc oh, I did. Look at me. Mm -hmm. You know me so well. I do know you so well. I had to tell mm -hmm. Nicole's situation, too. So I told you my situation. Nicole has a whole new podcast space set up, and she covers herself around with sheets. So she kind of looks like what your boyfriend's, like, the your boyfriend in, like, high school's bedroom look like is kind of what Nicole's situation looks like. <laughs> I have you know my curtain that separates my dining room to my living room. I'm, like... Yeah, it's like pinned up to a, a room divider. <laughs> I did order some fancy, like, um, I think they're adhesive even. Maybe I have to install them, like wall panels that have, really? they're, they're like foam wall panels. Mm -hmm. um, but they're really neat. They're like white and sort of geometrical. And it's, I don't think geometrical is a word. I think it's just geometric. <laughs> uh, but it looks cool because this is, I have, I'm, my whole system is set up in my kitchen. So it's like in the public space. But it looks so it's really look nice. It looks nice. cool. Yeah. Yeah. In fact, just before the episode today, I pressed purchase on those wall panels. So I'm excited yeah. to get them. So yeah. hopefully audio will sound even better. It will. I think it just keeps getting better and better. And it's because of you guys. You guys are doing an awesome job with supporting us and making us want to do this and thrive to be better. 
and obviously the drugs are making me very lovey so i love you guys <laughs> we love you so much love you so much and thank you for supporting us and sharing us and please keep doing it's, so it really has been great i was yeah. thinking about it today in the car we had a really nice message and comment on threads from somebody and it just warms my heart and it made me feel like we've gotten so many of them and I was like, you know what? My period's coming up soon. I'm just going to grab some chocolate and some wine. And I'm going to read, like, all of our really nice comments. <laughs> and oh, it's going to make perfect. it all better. <laughs> We're just, just going like, to read perfect. them over and over. Yeah. We are perfect. I'll send you we? over one of my, di- my diapers. And we can sit in diapers together and just <laughs> live our best lives and relish just, in how good it is. Send me one of your diapers. I want that crunchy ass. You do. Mm-mm. Nicole's never been more turned on by me. I can see it in her eyes. So yep. it's true. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yep. Can't resist. Nope. <laughs> All right. So t- do I believe in reincarnation? Is that the question? Where? Yeah. Well, where do you stand on it? I stand in. I think it's a huge possibility. Um, it's something that mm-hmm. I have never talked about, or have went under to talk about, or have talked to a medium or anyone about it, but. There are so many stories of people who have experienced that or believe they have experienced that. Um, Like we talked about before, children who have stories and can know things that there'd be no way anyone would know. So for sure, I believe there's a huge Mm -hmm. possibility. And I like the idea of it. I love the idea to think that, yeah, that you kind of go. It's a fun idea. Yeah, like you pass away and then maybe you're coming back to learn a lesson. Like maybe we're just in a lesson here. Um, Mm -hmm. So I think it's fun. And I think it's a fun topic. It is. Mm Mm-hmm. That's why I thought that this would be a super fun topic. And yeah. it'd be a good one for you to just relax in your diaper and mm-hmm. listen to. <laughs> See if anyone so hears the So feel free to interject. Okay. Yeah. Just <laughs> interject with your crunchy diaper and, and any questions you have. <laughs> perfect. <laughs> you know how I noticed too? What? I say perfect a lot in this podcast. Have you noticed like when you, have you been listening back and be like, gosh, I use that word often. Perfect. I don't think I've noticed. I use perfect. It's I funny use we we both all the time. We both listen and like hear each other's mm-hmm. common. I go yes, yep, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, yep, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm yep. Oh, that's wild. <laughs> <laughs> that should be my new slogan. I'll put it on T-shirts. That's wild. That's wild. I'm probably gonna say it a million times this episode. <laughs> you are, and I'm gonna say perfect a million times. Perfect. So. That is so fucking perfect. Wild. Let's go. Yeah. <laughs> All right, yeah, let's get into it because I'm telling you, I've got 24 pages we're going through, so buckle up. So we will just start with the fact that it is almost impossible to talk about reincarnation without mentioning Dr. Ian Stevenson. He's the renowned psychiatrist and founder and director of the Division of Perceptual Studies at the University of Virginia School of Medicine, and this is where he spent most of his life studying the paranormal near-death experiences, parapsychology, all that good, kooky, weird stuff that we love. Um, He became known for his research into cases that he considered suggestive of reincarnation, which is essentially the idea that emotions and memories and even the physical bodily features can be passed on from one incarnation to another. So in the course of his 40 years doing you know, international field work, he researched 3,000 cases of children who claimed to remember past lives. Now, not saying all 3,000 of these were legit, but that's a lot of claims. I mean, that's a so life's work. is this work. guy still alive? Yeah. Is this guy still alive? He is not. He's not. He, has, he, would, he just sounds badass. Like, he sounds like someone I just want to pick their brain. Oh, wait till you see his picture, too. He looks like your old, like, grumpy grandpa. Um, Ooh, I love yeah, a grumpy grandpa. A grumpy grandpa that's totally into reincarnation. Um, oh, and I wish he was my grandpa. That's the best. Although I have some very cruel grandpas. Um, so yeah, 3,000 cases. It's a crazy amount. Um, and Stevenson helped to found the Society for Scientific Exploration in 1982. And he was the author of around 300 papers and 14 books on reincarnation, which is a lot. That is wild. It's like some L. Ron Hubbard writing right there. <laughs> it just keeps going and going. <laughs> yeah. Now, obviously, there's plenty of skeptics and critics of his evidence and studies, people claiming his bias, that certain evidence was anecdotal, 
observational selection, confirmation bias, uh, all you know, all that jazz, and that some of these claims could be dispelled by cryptoamnesia and confabulation. Uh, which cryptoamnesia, if you haven't heard of it, it's when a forgotten memory returns without recognition of it being that, a memory. So okay. the brain receives it as new information, kind of like memory bias. Mm -hmm. And confabulation um, is just a memory that consists of like made up or distorted ideas. Um, it's usually associated with brain damage and subsets of dementia, though. So who knows? Who knows? Okay. And a lot of these are children. So it's like, are these children really experiencing dementia <laughs> yeah that's what i was wondering if it's mainly children and they're yeah it just sounds like an excuse because again why would children all of a sudden remember past i don't know past memories and there's no way they'd have dementia it just sounds a little silly yeah sounds a little well, silly you know brain damage world. you know if your kid it would have brain damage yeah like, people are so ready to argue and like throw down mm -hmm. over subjects like this over Leave any grumpy subject grandpa really. alone Leave him alone. <laughs> Leave grumpy grandpa alone. And I mean, I'm not here to say it's all true. These obviously could mm -hmm. be true. Uh, but looking at the magnitude of his work and the amount of cases he investigated, I mean, 3,000. Like, I believe that there's something to all of it. I mean, like a whole fucking department at a university is dedicated to his studies. We're not just talking some like building out in the woods of some rando. Like, it's the University of Virginia. <laughs> like, legit yeah there seems to be enough compelling evidence to support like to continue supporting and funding it you know yeah enough science behind for it sure that a college would look into it yeah yep. yeah i mean don't get me wrong that like the human body is an amazing instrument and many many things can be explained away by standard science but when you think about like the history of really anything related to the paranormal there's just there's just too much evidence for like even just ghosts and spirits mm -hmm. Like, you're telling me that, I'm, not, I'm talking directly to my husband here, <laughs> you're telling me that millions of people with claims, including us, are just making this shit up? Like, come on. That's ridiculous. I mean, I mean, right down to the government finally admitting, like, to recovering non-human biologics from UFOs or UAP, like, crack shites. Um, and the CIA declassified documents on the analysis and assessment of the gateway process. Did you hear about that? Yes, and I am oh so God. hard about it. We're <laughs> doing so hard. We're doing an episode. We're yes. collaborating on this one. Um, which, if if our listeners don't know what the gateway process is, it's essentially like astral projection, and the government is realizing that this may actually be a possibility, and they declassified documents on their experiments on it. You see how long ago that was? Because I believe the government knows all this stuff way before they put it out. Like even the alien thing. They're like, oh, it's like 100 years. We'll, we'll put it out now. So it'll be interesting yeah. to read that and kind of start figuring that stuff out. How long they've kind of known that there's something else there. Yeah, I mean, I was going to just say, like, I totally understand that we can't trust the government. <laughs> but mm -hmm. I am totally one of those people that think that when they release information like this, they're just trying to completely distract the country from something else. Like when yeah. Reagan was talking about the aliens to distract the nation from the Iran Contra scandal way back, uh, but to me it doesn't mean it's false. It just means they're using it mm -hmm. shadily. Yep, they know when to do it. Is that a word? Shadily. <laughs> Insert tenacious D. The government totally sucks. The government totally <laughs> sucks, <laughs> yeah, motherfucker. The government totally sucks. <laughs> oh Insert. god, now I want to sing the whole song. Ben Franklin was a rebel in <laughs> <laughs> we can just do this the whole podcast just tenacious d we're gonna have a, a whole tenacious d yep. karaoke episode <laughs> um, okay okay back to stevenson studies our boy even ian stevenson so i'm gonna take you through a couple notes that he compiled during a seminar to brief the audience like about his work and what he does um and when he discusses the components of a complete case of reincarnation, there are some of these like top traits that seem to come about most often in the person in question. Um, so we'll go we'll go over some of those. Um, so when there's an individual that the reincarnation is in question, they typically will talk about strange dreams of a past life. They'll make statements about persons, places, or events of the previous life interesting they will exhibit unusual behavior that corresponds to the behavior of the previous personality quote unquote he uses that term a lot previous personality 
Um, they may have phobias or aversions to things like the instruments or the mode of death, like being scared of firearms and knives and vehicles, etc. Uh, and even the sight of death, like a place where a drowning occurred or a plane went down. Um, sometimes there's a vengefulness or an inclination to a crime related to the previous personality. Uh, a child may choose to play make-believe, but is most apt to pretending that they're in the vocation or the job field of the previous personality. So like always wanting to be a fireman or a scientist mm-hmm. or a Starbucks barista. <laughs> Who knows? <Yep. laughs> just, that's, you know, I only want to do that. I want to make my lattes. Yeah. I wonder how many phobias, like, that people have. Like, I have a phobia of rubber bands, for example, which makes no sense. Was I, like, in a past life murdered by rubber bands? Like, you know what I mean? (laughs) Strangulation by rubber bands. Yeah. It could be. something. Yeah, like, all those phobias that people have, that sounds like it could be, like, almost like a connection to it. Because you You never know. Especially when you don't know why it's there. Yeah, and yeah. Sp- like weird ones too. Like it's one thing if you've got like arachnophobia. It's like okay, everybody's got arachnophobia, mm-hmm. but yeah, rubber bands. Like what the fuck is that? Yeah, makes no sense. And me, terrifying. wooden sticks, not like wooden sticks like you find outside, but like mm-hmm. popsicle sticks. Like I can't yeah. like tongue depressors. Can't even talk about it right now. I'm gonna puke. Was I beaten with wooden sticks as a child? I have no idea. I really. But there, maybe sleeping, there's something to it. Yeah, when I'm sleep when we're sleeping together and you're. And we're in the same bed. I'm just poking you in the middle of the night, rubbing them against your face. Oh, God. <laughs> I'm going to take a rubber band and slowly tickle your nose with it to wake you up. <laughs> oh, my gosh. I had an ex-boss as a joke. I came back from lunch, and he did a whole pack of rubber bands because he doesn't believe me. People don't believe me with this. And he put a whole bag of rubber bands on my desk, and I left, and I like told him, like, fuck off. Clean that- call me when you clean that up. That is like, so mean. I know. Don't do that. I mean, I remember testing you in high school with it, like pretending to like about to snap you. Um, oh, that's the worst. But like, I, and then I realized it's as bad as mine with popsicle sticks and shit. Yeah. Um, the same thing though, like, well, not the same thing, but when I was in school, we did projects with popsicle sticks and I literally had to be excused and sit outside in the hall and I couldn't do the project. I think I just took an, like an N or an incomplete mm-hmm. or something because I was like I can't do it they're probably like this is bullshit I'm like I'm serious <laughs> I can't do it so who knows maybe maybe that's part of uh part of a past that's life right. maybe so um along with that uh they're also sometimes able to pick out the specific person or location slash picture that corresponds to the past life when presented with multiple choice options and often with no options so like if they're if a person's like, you know, pick which one of these houses were yours. If they have evidence, if they found this previous life, which there are cases where they're able to actually find the person in question that was deceased, pick out the picture of the person or, you know, with like 10 options and they're able to pick it out, which is wild. That is wild. <laughs> That's wild. Wild. <laughs> That's wild. And so, yeah. So anyway. They just know they've not been privy to any alternative options. And in some cases, individuals actually have birthmarks or birth defects that seem to correspond with a wound or a manner of death from the previous life, which is also wild. That is badass. <laughs> yeah, like if they were shot in the head and yeah. they have a scar or a birthmark at the same spot they were shot or were stabbed oh. in the side and they have a birthmark there. Like, I want to go work at this college now. This is what I meant to do. Yeah. I know. I want to I want to work That'd there, too. Sweet. So in uh, his 1997 work, Reincarnation and Biology, a contribution to the etiology of birthmarks and birth defects, there were 200 cases in which birthmarks and birth defects seemed to correspond in some way to a wound on the deceased person whose life the child recalls. It's a lot, yeah. which is cool. Yeah. So Dr. Stevenson clearly devoted his life to not only the subject to parapsychology and other phenomena in general, and if you will, anything weird, wink, wink, or else gone weird, <laughs> plug, the plug in, plugging my own show, <laughs> plug it in. Um, so as an elder, he stepped down as the director of the Division of Perceptual Studies in 2002 when he was 81 years old. So he worked on this shit for a long time. Yeah. Uh, unfortunately, like I've mentioned, he passed away from pneumonia at the age of 88 on February 8th of 2007, um, which is my brother's birthday, February, February 8th. Um, 
shout out Alex. I don't think he's ever listened to this podcast, but <laughs> hi. Hi. <laughs> hi, Alex. Um, so now, like, not unlike our conversation in the paranormal episode in the 1960s, Stevenson set a combination lock using a secret word or phrase and placed it in a filing cabinet in the department, telling his colleagues he would try to pass the code to them after his death. So presumably, if someone had a vivid dream about him in which there seemed to be a word or a phrase that kept being repeated, they would try to open it using the combination suggested. Um, unfortunately, we're going on 16 years now with nobody opening the cabinet. So, you know, who oh. else? take it as you will. Yeah. I was really, when I started reading that, I was like, oh, please tell me they opened it. Please. It's, it's like, like Houdini, Houdini too. Like, please. Yeah, please. <laughs> please, please, please. So I'm also going to mention one last person by the name of Dr. Jim Tucker. We're going to hear about him a lot, too. Um, again, it's also impossible to talk about all this without bringing him into play. Uh, he is a child psychiatrist and professor of psychology and neurobehavioral sciences at the University of Virginia School of Medicine. And he essentially took over all of Stevenson's work um, once he died, and he continues the research to this day. Uh, so Tucker reports that in about 70% of the cases of children claiming to remember past lives, the deceased died from an unnatural cause, suggesting that traumatic death may be linked to the hypothesized survival of self. He further indicates that the time between death and apparent rebirth is on average 16 months and that unusual birthmarks might match fatal wounds suffered by the deceased. So kind of like Stevenson said. That's insane. That's interesting. I wonder if it's like a connection because maybe, you know, something traumatic, sometimes you just remember that or you feel it more. So maybe Mm -hmm. like if you pass away that way in a traumatic way, it's almost like you just have this traumatic trauma inside of you that you're feeling and somehow connect it back to things. It's really interesting. That's insane. This this traumatic trauma. (laughs) Traumatic trauma. It's extra traumatic. Traumatic trauma. That sounds like a band name. Traumatic trauma. (laughs) Uh, yeah, I mean, I don't know, maybe it's, it is, it's like they felt like 16 months, like, so if somebody dies, the average is 16 months, they're going to come back, which is pretty fucking fast. Yeah, that is like, really fast. So maybe it's like these people felt like, oh, I'm, you know, my life was cut short. This was not my decision. Mm-hmm. I got to come back and do it again, which side note is why I believe that my current dog, Theo, is my dog, Coda Reincarnated. He was born on my husband's birthday. November 17th, which was almost nine months to the day after Coda died, he was born, which yeah. is like, it's in that time frame. It um, and they, they exhibit a lot of the same personality. And there's just something about him. There's just something about Theo that like feels super familiar. And like we've mentioned before, like Coda's life was cut short. He was attacked by dogs. You know, if you didn't listen to the episode before, just days after 12 days i think it was yeah. after honey died and uh he was kind of a shit his whole life like everybody knows coda was a l- <laughs> he was a little booger i disagree <laughs> i think coda was the sweetest little baby of all time and he had he a bad a rap. sweet little baby he booger he had a bad rap he would eat inanimate objects he would eat light bulbs he got into shit all the time and but he was he was he was full of love. All he wanted to do was like crawl up into your nose. Um, he just wanted to make but out. But it was just he did want to make out. Um, we almost got rid of him though. We almost got rid of him before we got pregnant because we're like, there's no way he's gonna handle a baby. Like he needs all the attention all the time. He always pushed Honey out of the out of the way to get the attention. We're like, he's not gonna handle a baby. We have Violet and he completely changed. Like it was a different dog. He, like, had a purpose, finally. He was so sweet. He never destroyed anything. He stuck by her side all of the time. It was like, what happened? Like, it's amazing. Animals can tell babies. I mean, that happened with all of our animals, too. And, Mm -hmm. I I mean, we have the most evil cat ever. And she will smack you. But with anything we've had as a baby, she is somehow the sweetest little thing. So, yeah. They know. They 10 know years of being be. a booger and then 
And then Violet comes and he's like, oh my God, my life has purpose. And then of course, a year or so later, a year and some change, two years, yeah, he's attacked and he dies. So circling back to this whole conversation, you know, this hypothesis that if somebody or something, an animal dies of, a, you know, a traumatic death, it might be linked to more often than not coming back. Like I'm saying, maybe because they felt like it was cut short. Like mm-hmm. he finally had a purpose. Maybe he decided, I want to come back and watch Violet grow up as Theo. Unfinished people, business. They probably, people probably think I'm crazy. You're not crazy. This is weird stuff, and it's not crazy. This is weird yeah. stuff. Our listeners don't think I'm crazy. If you're still listening, you probably don't think I'm crazy. Um, but even my husband, which everybody knows, um, the skeptic, he is not completely turned off to the idea that that is Coda. Really? Like, I think he's also recognized okay. that there's just something. There's just something with Theo. So, here, there's my little reincarnated dog. <laughs> so, let's get back to Dr. Tucker. Um, Dr. Tucker developed a strength of case scale, or the SOCS, which evaluates what he sees as four aspects of potential cases of reincarnation. Um, One is whether it involves birthmarks or defects that correspond to the supposed previous life. Two is the strength of the statements about the previous life. Three is the relevant behaviors as they relate to the previous life. And four, as an evaluation of the possibility of a connection between the child reporting a previous life and the supposed previous life. So that's a scale he uses when he researches all these. Um, And I want to mention just, you know, Dr. Tucker, he did most of his research in the United States. And Dr. Ian Stevenson did most of his research abroad for whatever reason. So most of his cases, those 3,000 were like overseas. That's good because you want to mix the studies, Mm. especially if you're trying to get scientific evidence. So that makes sense for sure. For sure. For sure. So critics have argued that there is no material explanation for the survival of self. But Tucker actually suggests that quantum mechanics may offer a mechanism by which memories and emotions could carry over from one life to another. Um, And this is where I get really into it. And like my husband has stated, like we're all made of energy, Mm -hmm. atoms, subatomic particles, energy cannot be destroyed so where does it go where do we go if you're gonna tell me that you know i'm gonna call bullshit yep you know yeah so yeah, every time someone's like this is what happens i'm like nah no you don't know nobody knows you don't yeah. no and again with all this stuff with reincarnation i don't know we don't know it's a nice idea it is. but so anyway this is obviously absolutely insane to me and frankly i think it's really fucking cool <laughs> Um, again, like we've said, this is a weird podcast, so let's not forget where we are. We're storytellers. I'm not claiming anything's factual. I'm just providing you with the stories I've come across and the quote-unquote evidence that was gathered during these studies. Um, and you can make up your own mind. You know, I'll tell you that I am in the camp of most of the stuff being real. (laughs) Um, but at the end of the day, who the fuck cares if I'm wrong, you know? Mm -hmm. If I die and I'm worm food, I hope the worms get a belly full. So, yeah, let's get into it. Let's, let's do, do it. it. Let's see what I'll feel at the end of all this. We'll I think see. we're pretty much the I'm same. I'm curious. Thing, but we'll see what I what I think. All right. I won't ask you to get into this, but an episode or two back, you told me mm-hmm. that you heard of a case that somebody wrote a book or and they were like it was called it was just like a scam or yeah. something like that. So at the end of this, let's let's chat about that. So your market. Okay. I'm gonna go with a shorter story first. And some of these you may have heard, some of them you may have not, but They get a little longer as we go on. So this first case is the case of Barbro Carlin. So Barbro Carlin was born in Sweden in 1954. And when she was a young child, she claimed her name was Anna Frank, a.k.a. Anne Frank. Really? Despite Anne Frank dying nine years prior to her birth, she exhibited strange behavior pretty early on. She had a fear of men in uniform, spontaneous memories and dreams of past life as Anne, and she frequently asked about her real parents and asked where Margot was. Um, And her parents had no idea what she was talking about. Like, who is Margot? Well, Margot was Anne Frank's older sister. And at the time of all these seemingly nonsensical ramblings, her parents didn't even know who Anne Frank was. The diary of Anne Frank hadn't even been published yet. And when it was, it was initially published in Dutch. So like- Wow. 
mm-hmm. where you know yeah where's this coming from so her parents were obviously skeptical they took her to a psychologist where they couldn't find anything psychologically wrong with her and after you know numerous conversations and her sticking with the story when barbara was 10 years old and these claims continued they decided to travel to Amsterdam to the home of Anne Frank. So they get to town. Her parents are a little bit lost. Amsterdam's a big city. This is the 50s, 60s. There's not, there's no GPS. <laughs> so they're lost. They didn't know where to go to get to Anne Frank's house. So they're about to, I think they're about to ask, answer, or ask somebody, you know, where we're going. Do we need a cab? And Barbara insisted that they did need a cab because she knew exactly where she was going, despite never visiting Amsterdam. Barbara led her parents through all these back streets directly to Anne Frank's house. Interesting. When she was inside, she immediately felt the familiarity of the place. And she even identified where she used to have, where Anne Frank used to have pictures of, like, old Hollywood film stars on the wall. And she said that out loud, like, oh, this is where I had these old film star pictures. And then her mom mom was like, well, there's nothing there now. Like, where are these? Well, the tour guide overheard her and said, actually, the pictures did used to be exactly in that spot. And that was when her parents really started to believe, you know, their daughter, which is like, really, it took you that long. It took you. (laughs) Didn't you believe her maybe a little bit before you went to Amsterdam? I would be freaking the fuck out, honestly, if I was the parents. Like, yeah. For real. Especially way back then. Again, when Mm -hmm. there's not Google, all this shit, like, it's easier to debunk everything nowadays. But, like, back then... Uh, where is she researching this shit that she could lie about exactly. it? Exactly. And the book wasn't out yet. None of that was really, you know, large until it happened. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, it's crazy. Yeah. So so they're at the Anne Frank Museum, and eventually she just became completely overwhelmed, and she had to leave the museum, like, in tears. Um, and not, af- not long after this, Barbara, like Anne, actually became a childhood writer, publishing her very first book, the bestseller Man on Earth at 12 Years Old. And she spent the remainder of her life fully embracing her past life and talking about it publicly. Um, she wrote three other books, but the one about her experience with reincarnation is called And the Wolves Howled, Fragments of Two Lifetimes. And I think that was out in 2000, the year 2000. Um, unfortunately, she did end up dying October 12th of 2022. Um, there isn't a whole lot more details. Again, that was a really long time ago, but she spent her life embracing it and being like, oh, I wonder Anne Frank's father, because Anne Frank's father is the only one who ended up surviving, sadly, from her family during the Holocaust. I, and he's the one who actually found Anne's diaries to put, the, you know, put them out and thought, read them, like, I want her mm-hmm. story to be told. I wonder, because he was alive for a while, I wonder what he would have, what he thought about that. It'd be interesting to see if he said anything about it or if they met. Yeah. Because he was a really interesting man himself. I would, we should yeah we should look that up and look at the dates and see if they correspond at all with um with barbara's claims and i don't know how long he lived but i believe there was um a story that i didn't include that where barbara actually met one of anne frank's cousins yeah. and after conversations with the cousin the cousin was pretty on board like this is this is wild yeah, for sure <laughs> they said that exactly they said this is wild <laughs> well, that would be. I'm just looking up right now. I mean, his date of death. I mean, he died at 91 years old. It's Otto Frank. And his date of death looks like August 19th, 1980. Yeah. Oh, interesting. Okay. So who knows? So, It'd be interesting. That would be 20 some, 22 years before yeah. she died. So they had to have had some sort of interaction. Yeah. How would you right? feel? Maybe he didn't want, maybe he was not into it at all. Well, how would you feel like if someone came and, like, let's say something happened to Violet, you know, tragic like that, and then someone being like, I think I'm your daughter, or I was your daughter. You know, it's like, it'd be interesting to see how you'd react or feel about it. I'd probably be like, you need to jump that train back to crazy town. (laughs) Despite all this stuff that we talk about, I'd be like, what? (laughs) But who knows? If they've got some mm-hmm. compelling evidence, I, I don't know what you could convince yep. me of. So that's the story wow. of Barbara Carlin. That, yeah, that may be one of the more famous cases. And it's not huge, but I wanted to just cover it as a starter. So this next story is a little bit longer. And this one completely blows my mind. So buckle up. Um, this is about the Pollock twins. Have you heard of them? 
That name sounds so familiar for some reason. So oh, twins. So I had a little help with this one from the God. What is it? I think it was like the PSI Encyclopedia. Um, there are so many stories about this, and they're kind of all over the place. So I had you know some help on my notes uh, with this one because it's just a huge story. So let's get into the Pollock twins. So Joanna Pollock, born in 1946 to John and Florence Pollock was the couple's third child and first daughter. In 1951, following a family move to Hexham in Northumberland, their second daughter, Jacqueline, was born. If you can't tell, this is in the UK. (laughs) Um, As their parents were preoccupied with their grocery and milk delivery business, their daughters were raised mostly by their maternal grandmother. Um, But the girls were inseparable. Uh, Joanna liked to mother Jacqueline a lot, uh, which the younger girl accepted, you know. Uh, and Joanna liked wearing costumes and acting in plays she made up. She was generous and shared freely with other children. And both girls liked combing people's hair, especially their dads. Uh, Joanna had a premonition she would never grow up, though, often saying, I will never be a lady. Which was weird to say. It's creepy. Can I brush your hair? <laughs> creepy. Can you imagine a creepy kid, like, brushing your... Can I brush your hair? I'm totally into it. And then says some creepy shit like that. <laughs> Whisper in your ear, I will never be a lady. <laughs> no thing. See, that's yeah. why I always say kids are creepy as fuck. Kids are creepy. <laughs> yep. Um, so at the age of three, Jacqueline fell into a bucket, an accident that actually caused a small gash on her forehead over her right eye near the root of her nose. This formed a permanent scar that was slightly depressed and was especially visible in cold weather. Jacqueline also had a roundish dark birthmark on the left side of her waist. Keep that in mind. I'm sure you know where I'm going with that. Yep. (laughs) On May 7th of 1957, Joanna was 11 and Jacqueline was 6, and they were struck by a car and killed while walking to church with a friend. Both of them. Yes. Uh, The driver was a local woman who decided to commit suicide by driving after taking what she thought were lethal quantities of aspirin and phenobarbital. Um, Witnesses saw her driving erratically and bearing down on the children who were blocked from escape by like a wall beside the sidewalk. And the impact tossed them into the air like cricket balls. um, And both were killed instantly. Made headlines throughout Britain. It was absolutely crazy obviously without i don't even have to say it their parents were devastated yeah um but while florence tried to avoid thinking about the girls because she was just so heartbroken um john the dad like devoted himself to talking about them um so much so that uh florence had you know such an aversion to talking about it that it almost caused a divorce like they were just yeah hot and cold over the issue um which that's fucking tough i don't know if i could survive a child dying no i mean I'm that's sure. a the rates i don't know the rates on top of my head but the rates for of divorce for parents who've lost a child is just huge you know i imagine it, it's extremely high yeah it is it's really sad because you don't you know you don't know what's how you're gonna feel about something like that you don't know how you need to express your sadness and who knows if that partner you're with is going to have that same response as you i can understand it's really exactly sad. yeah exactly i mean and as a mother we've all thought about it too and i've you know it's just Mm-hmm. I don't think I would be able to live if that happened to me. I no. can't. I always think of the scene in uh, the movie. Oh my God. What is the movie? Help me out here. It's the one where the girl sticks her heart out the window and gets decapitated. <laughs> you know the one? The fucked up one? Oh. Um, oh my God. Everybody's yelling at us again. <laughs> Sorry, we make you guys yell at us all the time. And we were just talking about how much we love this actress, too. <laughs> Yeah. She's in a she's in a show that you just recommended to me. Oh my god, why can I not think of this? We're gonna <sighs> we're gonna insert a pause here while we look it up. Pause. Do, Bam. Do, do, do. <laughs> this is where I'm gonna insert music because it's gonna drive me crazy. All right. We figured it out. Actually, Nicole did. Yep. I figured it out. You're going to kick yourself mm-hmm. in the in the crunchy ass yep. when I tell you. <laughs> okay. Bucking Hereditary with yes. Tony Collette. Yes. 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 I always think, when I think about losing a child, I think about that scene oh, the night no. that she found out that her daughter died. And her performance in that, 
was so gut-wrenching like yes. i can feel her pain like maybe she won of some sort of award for that but if she didn't holy shit mm-hmm. she needs to and if you have not seen hereditary you need to see it now because it's so fucked up but trigger warning there is obviously spoiler alert child death i'll use my word the whole traumatic movie. trauma traumatic trauma it was traumatic trauma. trauma yes it was insane yes um so yeah long story short i i have no idea how i would react but i do know i would react at least that way Mm -hmm. that tony collected so yeah um so anyway the girls passed away um they were beside themselves uh but florence soon became pregnant again and john became convinced that joanna and jacqueline were about to be reincarnated into the family as twins Florence rejected this belief because obviously it sounds insane. Yeah. Um, and her doctor predicted a single birth based on palpation, fetal heartbeat, and the lack of twins in either parent's family. However, Florence bore twin girls on October 4th of 1958, and they were named Jillian and Jennifer. Jennifer had a birthmark that looked like Jacqueline's scar and a second birthmark in the same exact place as Jacqueline's birthmark. Wild. Wild. Insert wild here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so Jillian and Jennifer made several statements and recognitions relating to Joanna and Jacqueline between the ages of three and seven. And our boy, Dr. Ian Stevenson, investigated the case after learning about it through newspaper coverage in 63. That same year, when the twins were four years old, he met the family at their home, interviewed the parents at length, and examined the girls for birthmarks. He met the family again in 67 and corresponded with them until next visiting them in 78 so he stayed in their lives yeah for a while you know yeah. continuing yep um so in 78 the girls were 20 at that point he did blood tests that he had arranged to determine their zygosity which showed that they were monozygotic which is identical which is weird you know if you're identical you should you should have identical birthmarks and oh is like it that, so. is it to that extreme like if you are identical that you have everything from the same birthmarks i i believe so wow i didn't I know mean, that if that's yeah because that because mm-hmm. i know identical you like look the same but yeah interesting oh if anyone yeah. doesn't know i was a twin ha 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 wait what but i was a twin but my mom lost the baby at three months and it wasn't identical, obviously. So my mom had to stay in bed rest. So I could have been a twin. My dad used to tell me I ate my twin. So if I ever had um, a bad, like, if my mm-hmm. tummy hurt, he said it was my twin trying to come out of my stomach. That's so fucked up. <laughs> <laughs> I do remember so, this now that you're talking about it. Yeah. For some reason, it blew my mind I, over again. It's my twin. Yep. It's your twin. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right, so so we're going to rewind a little bit back. So there's more okay. there's more to this story. Um, so when the twins were about three, the parents brought out the toys that had belonged to their deceased daughters, uh, which had been boxed and stored in the attic. Jillian claimed the doll that had belonged to Joanna, and Jennifer claimed the one that had belonged to Jacqueline. They both said the dolls had been gifts from Santa Claus, as they had been for Joanna and Jacqueline. And when Jillian saw a toy clothes ringer that had also been a Santa Claus present to, to Joanna, she said, there is my toy ringer, adding that Santa had brought it. And the girls, the girls quarreled over none of the toys. Like, they knew which ones were theirs. And they matched the previous daughters. Um, Florence, the mother, occasionally overheard Jillian and Jennifer, Jennifer discussing the details of the accident. Once she came across Jillian cradling Jennifer's head, saying, The blood's coming out of your eyes. That's where the car hit you. Uh, Oh, my God. (laughs) John Pollock, the dad, recalled that when he identified the bodies, Jacqueline's head had been bandaged above the eyes. Jillian once pointed out to Jennifer's forehead birthmark and said, That is the mark Jennifer got when she fell on a bucket. They were not informed of any of this. Kids, stop being creepy as fuck. So, God. I know. <laughs> so Florence had worn a smock while helping John with the milk delivery business, but put it away when she ceased the work shortly after her daughter's deaths. When the twins were about four and a half, John wore the smock to do some painting, and Jennifer asked him, why are you wearing mommy's coat? She then became annoyed at Jillian for not recognizing it. The older sister had been at school and had not seen her mother wearing the garment. 
Uh, when John asked Jennifer how she knew the smock was Florence's, Jennifer said that her mother had worn it while delivering milk. Milk. The Pollocks had moved away from Hexham when the twins were about nine months old. And when they were about four years old, the family visited Hexham again for the first time. So the girls had not, you know, been there before. As they walked toward the park, but were not yet in sight of it, Jillian and Jennifer said they wanted to go across the road to the park and clearly showed that they knew the way. If you can't tell, these are like yep. points of points of interest. Yep. Um, according to John Pollock, when the twins discussed the accident between themselves, they often spoke in the present tense as if they were reliving it. I wonder how their father, John, like, because he, you know, said this when she was pregnant, like, we believe, you know, I believe that this... I wonder what gave mm-hmm. him that feeling. Yeah. Like, I don't know. wonder what would make him think that way. Maybe just that parental gut feeling. I mean, you always hear about, like, the mother's mm-hmm. gut. But, yeah. you know, maybe the father had a just a gut feeling, I guess. Um, the twins looked most like their maternal grandmother, who had done the most to raise Joanna and Jacqueline. And even though Florence was now entirely available, they still just clung mm-hmm. to that grandma. Also, like their elder sisters, the twins liked to comb people's hair, especially their father's. Although I do not think they were whispering, I'm never going to become a lady. I'll never be a lady. <laughs> I'm just going to go behind Mark tomorrow and just whisper. And sit here. I'll be a lady. I'll never be a lady. Cool. Yeah. fingers through his hair. So Jillian was more sociable and generous with the other children and showed the same early interest in costumes and acting that Joanna had. And she generally just seemed more mature uh, than her twin sister, despite their identical age. And remember that they weren't twins yep there was six what eight six and nine did you say or something like six, six and nine yeah they yeah. were just, they were apart they mm-hmm. weren't um but they were still acting like there was an age difference the twins did have phobias related to cars uh, their mother noticed that they would be very careful crossing the street holding hands though she knew that could be related to her own caution uh, but on one occasion when a car engine started near them in an enclosed alleyway John observed the girls like cringing in terror and clinging to each other, like crying, like the car, the car, it's coming for us. Like, I guess being reminded oh. of the wall that had prevented their escape mm-hmm. in their previous lives. Yeah. So um, at the time of their deaths, the, you know, the previous daughters, Jacqueline had still been learning to write. Her teacher concerned that she was still holding the pencil upright in her fist, suggested to the parents that they correct the habit by slapping her hand. Which is fucked up. Yep. <laughs> like, what kind of teacher is going to be like, oh, your daughter's, her her posture for writing is wrong. Just fucking slap her hand. <laughs> it's wild back in the day, right? Wild it back is. in the day. It's wild. Um, and when Jillian and Jennifer began learning to write at the age of four, Jillian immediately held the pencil properly while Jennifer held it upright in her fist. And she only started holding it properly at age seven, and even as a young adult would still sometimes revert to the first grip, like the fist grip. Mm -hmm. Joanna was somewhat slender of build, as was Jillian, and likewise Jennifer, somewhat stocky build, matched Jacqueline's. Joanna had a more splay-footed gait than Jacqueline did, and this difference showed up in Jillian and Jennifer also. Uh, back to the to the birthmarks at birth a dark brown roundish birthmark was observed on the left side of jennifer's waist at the spot where there had been a similar mark on jacqueline's interesting and according to florence this mark was slightly depressed when jennifer was born and showed up more during cold weather as was the case with jacqueline's scar and no one else in the family had similar birthmarks so as mentioned before uh dr ian stevenson noted that since the twins were monozygotic and therefore identical genetically Genetics cannot explain Jennifer's birthmarks. Mm -hmm. As Stevenson states in later work, he finds it inconceivable that John and Florence could mold the behaviors of their twin daughters, like, so exactly to match that of their deceased daughters. Like, just to a T. Without the girls ever slipping up at all, you know? Yeah. Yeah, not, like, learned behavior. Like, a lot of behavior that's not, can't be learned. Yeah. Mm Yeah. So, as most reincarnation stories with you know children in past lives as the twins grew older uh, they forgot their past life memories um, and during their early years John refrained from referring to their statements about what they remembered nor did he discuss with them his belief in reincarnation which they learned about only at the age of 13. So the twins went on to live normal lives um, and when Dr. Stevenson met them in their 20s they said they remembered nothing about their past lives 
They accepted their parents' belief that they were their elder sisters reincarnated, but also showed mild skepticism about reincarnation, like, in general. But they're like, well, mm-hmm. our parents say it. So they just think, like, oh, my parents are just bashing. Eh, maybe. It's probably what they're thinking. Yep. Or they're trying to make me be their past kids that passed yeah, away. Yeah, yeah. They like, just, maybe they're thinking that. They just went crazy yeah. and are trying to make us them. Yeah. But in 81... Yeah. Jillian actually experienced some inner visions in which she saw herself playing in a sandpit with her brothers, and she perfectly described the house, garden, lawns, and orchards that matched the house the family had lived in in Wickham um, when Joanna had been younger than four, um, and Jillian had never been to Wickham. So they started to come back a little bit when they were older. And yeah, so that's Mm -hmm. the story of the Pollock twins. Ooh. All right. That's a wild one. It is. So first one, I'm like, that's totally Anne Frank. <laughs> I yeah. don't know why. Yeah. This mm-hmm. one, I'm like, it could be. I'm saying 50-50 of what I think. Again, you don't 50, have to believe 50. me. Yep, I'm just saying like, like, ooh, if it was real, 50-50. It was real, yeah. So um, the, one, the, the, the points in this story that make me a believer in it really mm-hmm. are like the birthmarks. That the is, fact that's, that they were yeah, supposed to be crazy. monozygotic, identical. Um, the birthmarks are unexplainable. Like you said, I don't understand mm-hmm. that. And yeah, I don't know, just the behaviors. Again, like you could say, it, it, maybe it could be learned behavior, but I don't know. I don't know. There's a lot. Yeah. There's a lot of shit here. Let us know what you guys think. Yeah. It's a hard one. Yeah. I, I mm-hmm. will post some pictures of the girls, too, because I also think that mm-hmm. they look a little similar to the past Yeah, daughters. I would love to see the... The comparison for sure yeah like yeah side by side and i guess you could say like well they were you know technically related so of course there might be similarities mm-hmm. but actually in the barbara story she actually similarly looked a bit like anne frank too so we'll post those but yeah i don't know i recommend watching some specials on the pollock twins they can relive it for you maybe a little bit better than i did um maybe maybe you just need to see a video of it <laughs> um so yeah pollock twins Nicole's like, you will be convinced. Yeah. You will be convinced. So this one you may have heard of. All right. So this is the story of James Leininger. And I kind of have a sneaking suspicion that this may be the one that you heard that you may have thought was like debunked or or bullshit. So call me out okay. if this is the one, just because I'm curious. Yes. Because I want to see if your mind changes after more details. Because I don't know how hard... Or how deep you went into the one that you're talking about. So, okay. okay. So, when I first watched the Netflix series Surviving Death, which I highly recommend, by the way, um, there's not a ton of hard hitting evidence like brain scans and neuroscience in this one, um, but they're fun stories, at least. Okay. Yeah. There's some interesting near death experience stories in this special, um, which I will also be doing an episode on in the future, which I love those stories. Me too. Um, and they did some psychic medium stories. So it's not like a just reincarnation special. It's like kind of all the parapsychology. Um, it does get a little kooky when they start getting into this medium retreat in Holland. But that's all I'm going to say. Just go watch it. And if you're like me. Ooh, I'm going to have to watch oh this tonight God. If you're now. like me, your eyes might roll yes. in the back of your head when you listen to a couple of people. <laughs> Um, and if anybody's listening, they know exactly what I'm talking about. Or when you listen, you will know the point which I'm talking about. You're like, okay. 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 So, again, that is called Surviving Death from Netflix. Okay. So, let's get into James Leininger. James Leininger was born in San Francisco on April 10th, 1998 to Bruce and Andrea Leininger. Also, I think that's my other brother, Parker's birthday. Do I have, like, all my brother's birthdays in this episode? What the fuck? That's weird. Yeah, you do. Oh, my gosh. Okay. So, anyway, 98, when James was just under two years old, his father took him to the James Cavanaugh Flight Museum in Dallas, Texas, and little James was completely taken by the sight of the World War II planes and ended up basically having to be drug out of there because he wanted to stay. Not long after this, he was with his mama, and they were passing a little toy shop, as mom picked up a little propeller plane and said, look, there's even a bomb underneath. Uh, When James said, that's not a bomb, mummy. That's a drop tank. A drop tank, he was saying. He's little. He's a drop tank. 
Um, and when recalling this funny but kind of unbelievable moment to her husband, she learned that a drop tank is actually a real thing. It's an extra fuel tank fitted to an aircraft to extend its range. Um, again, this kid is under two years old. And he's like, what's a drop tank? Yeah. And she's like, didn't think a whole lot of, about it first. Just like, um, okay. Mm-hmm. Alrighty. Um, so shortly after turning two, James started having these just like wicked nightmares as often as like five times a week and they were all the same he would scream and frantically kick his legs in the air crying airplane crash plane on fire little man can't get out over and over this is the same dream creepy kids totally creepy kids. fucking creepy kids oh my gosh little <laughs> man can't get out so his parents would talk to him about these nightmares and ask him like hey you, you know who was this little man you're talking about and he was like me and they're like, um, mm-hmm. and then he told them that his plane was shot down and they were like, who shot your plane down? And he sort of incredulously like looks at him like, oh, by the Japanese, like, duh. And they're like, oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Again, this is only after he's just like two. Like these kids yeah. barely talk like full sentences at two. <laughs> mm-hmm. So about two weeks after learning more details about these dreams, James started to add more details apparently the little man uh, was also named james and he had flown a corsair from a boat named natoma quote unquote which despite sounding japanese he insisted was american and over the next three months more details came about he said that he had a friend named jack larson that had been shot down near iwo jima so again little dude starts talking about (laughs) specific boats planes people involved in this and when james would play he would constantly seem to reenact these sequences he would see in his head like he would crash his toy planes into furniture and break off the propellers he also began expressing his memories in art sort of like obsessively drawing this crude yet intense uh like naval aerial battles between americans and japanese uh including the japanese flag you know like the white with the red circle Um, And Mm -hmm. planes were crashing and burning and bullets and bombs were exploding. And there were always World War II scenes with propeller-driven aircrafts, not jets or missiles. It never veered away from that. It was always the same. I was saying if I was this little kid's mom, I would totally dress him like a little old man at the vet's home. Because (laughs) I'm obsessed with dressing little kids as As old people. Yeah, That's my favorite. Uh And I would just get him like a little vet's hat (laughs) and like a... (laughs) <laughs> little suspenders. I would just be dressing. Uh-huh. Yep, I'd get him little suspenders. I would dress him like a little old man. Just talk to the old folks about World War II. Oh my God, they would love yeah, that. I, I know, just set that little kid in like a nursing home. Oh yeah. my God. Oh, he could go that would off. make their day. Totally. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> so he's got all these insane details for being under three years old, basically. Or maybe he was about three at this time. But anyway around the same time he named american aircrafts correctly as wildcats and corsairs and referred to japanese plans as zeke's and betty's explaining that the boy names referred to fighter planes and the girl names to bombers which was correct Um, and he sometimes signed his drawings as james three so after all this crazy shit with their three-year-old Andrea Leininger, his mother, contacted regression therapist and author Carol Bowman after reading her book, Children's Past Lives, How Past Life Memory Affects Your Child. Uh, And Bowman suggested some techniques for relieving James' nightmares, uh, the chief of which was to give reassurance that the catastrophe was over, that it had happened in the past, and that he was safe now in his current life. And this seemed to cause like a steep drop in the frequency of the nightmares. Not necessarily of all the other shit that he was talking about but the nightmares you know all the terrifying stuff and side note um bowman actually continued to correspond with the leiningers for eight years and ended up putting them in touch with her literary agent for purposes of publishing a book telling james's story um the book soul survivor the reincarnation of a world war ii fighter pilot was published in 2009 when james was 20 uh, and had a brief run on on the new york times bestseller list so this woman kept in touch and so they wrote a book la da 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 and it's not the same one that I'm thinking about it's not at all okay okay nope I thought it might be so it's good to know Mm -hmm. okay so we're gonna go back to when he's little um just before James's fourth birthday 
uh, Bowman was asked by ABC, which planned to air a TV show on children's past life memories for her best case. She immediately thought of the Leiningers and uh, introduced them to the producers. Some footage was recorded, but the show never aired. Um, according to the Leiningers, the producers decided that the case was weak, evidently. Um, however, our boy, Dr. Jim Tucker, the one that took over Ian Stevenson's mm-hmm. work. What does he look like? So we know the other guy is grandpa, like a cranky grandpa. Do we know what this guy looks like? Jim Tucker, he, like in most of his pictures, he's like middle-aged. I think if he's not bald, he's sort of balding. He kind of looks like a doctor. He's got more of a kind face. He's not grumpy. Yeah. But he seems a little easier to approach. <laughs> I'm trying to give him a nickname. See, I'm just giving these people nicknames. Old Cranky Tuck. Grandpa. Tucky. Old Tuck? All right. Tucky. Tucky. All right, Old Tuck. <laughs> Our Old Tuck. Yep. What's Old Tuck saying? Old Tuck. So our bruh, Tuck, child psychiatrist, <laughs> an investigator of children's past life memories at the University of Virginia's Department of Psychiatry, Division of Perceptual Studies. Try saying that fast. He was also scheduled to appear on the show, um, but he recalled that apparently the entire show was considered too weak, not just James's case in particular. Tucker was given a copy of the footage and just kind of shelved it for the time being, and the, obviously the show didn't air. All of this, in a nutshell, was obviously alarming and hard to ignore. And despite all these wild details, his dad, Bruce, a devout Christian, seemed like incredulous to the idea that his son, James, could be this deceased World War II pilot reincarnated. He didn't... So he wasn't accepting it? He did not or, want to believe it. Like... Yeah. It, di- it didn't jive okay. with his religion, um, his beliefs. He's like, yeah, whatever. Um, I wonder what it is his reasoning was then or explanation for why his son was like that like what was his explanation who knows maybe he was just like like this kid's just cray god cray. says <laughs> god says no god so it's no i guess I don't know. so i guess because of all this bruce still decided to dive into research basically in hopes that he could discredit or rule out his son's claims and they could just brush it off but again, like, it was hard to ignore, so he had to do something. So he's like, let's just dive in and let's see if I can figure this shit out that it's not reincarnation. So remember, this is the early 2000s, so the internet was still relatively yeah. new. Um, these were the days of, like, Ask Jeeves and Yahoo search engines. <laughs> search results were not as refined no, as Google. not at all. No. So it took a lot of digging. He was already aware that the Corsair was an American World War II era plane. Searching the internet, he discovered that the USS Natoma Bay was an aircraft carrier that served in the Pacific in World War II, taking part in the Iwo Jima operation, and that a pilot named Jack Larson had been based on the ship. Hard to deny. Boom. Hard to deny. (laughs) Yeah. Um, So if we remember, little James had mentioned that in these memories, his name was also James, but he had a friend named Jack Larson. So Bruce began to actually reach out to Natoma Bay veterans. And while there was a Jack Larson that matched the time frame, he had not been killed in action. So after further digging, the attention shifted to a James Houston Jr., who had indeed been killed near Iwo Jima at age 21, and whose life James statement seemed to match pretty identically. Um, One exception was that Houston was shot down in an FM2 Wildcat and not a Corsair. Mm -hmm. Uh, Veterans couldn't recall any Corsairs on Natoma Bay, nor could the details of James' account of the plane being shot down be confirmed. However, a visit to Houston's sister, Anne Barron, uncovered a photograph of Houston standing in front of a Corsair, confirming that he had indeed flown this aircraft or been familiar with it. Clinching testimony. What do I wait a lot? Right, exactly. Um, so eyewitnesses had seen the plane was hit in the engine and blew away its propeller, which exploded in a ball of fire before it crashed, confirming James's accounts and all of his photos that he, you know, drew and colored. Um, and a unit logbook recording the crash can now be viewed online, like you can see it. Um, so it's getting more and more, yeah. <laughs> more and more accurate. Um, So our little James had made some interesting statements about two memories of the period between incarnations. So while he was in the afterlife, post-Houston death, pre-James's birth. So first... Oh, so he's even remembering afterlife. What? Yes. So first he said that he remembered choosing the Leiningers as his parents. 
um, I think he was playing with his dad and his and told his dad something like, you're a good daddy. Like, I mean, I knew you were going to be a good daddy when I picked you. Uh, <laughs> and his dad's bewildered. Like, no. what the yeah. fuck do you mean you picked me? <laughs> um, and then James went on to tell his dad that he saw his parents at a pink hotel having dinner on the beach in Hawaii when he picked them as his parents. And drum roll, please. That is where they got it on. Ooh. This is indeed where James was conceived. And Bruce and Andrea did have a moonlit dinner on the beach in Waikiki. Yeah, that's crazy. How would this kid know this? You think his parents are like telling him like, hey, we your mom and I, at the beach. we did it. We had sex at this pink hotel in Hawaii. We fucked we fucked. at the beach. And you came. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. take that. Oh, no, I'm gonna do that again <laughs> we should put it in once in every episode take that dick once in every episode <laughs> take that dick <laughs> um, so yeah mm. that's wild again um, we should have listeners count how many times they say wild in this episode now I'm just doing it on purpose but <laughs> Um, so in another instance, he was playing with his G.I. Joes, and he told his mom that he named them Billy, Walter, and Leon. And his mom, thinking that these are kind of weird, like, funny, mature names for a kid mm-hmm. to give his G.I. Joes, asked him, you know, why did you pick those names? And James said, because that's who met me when I got to heaven. Uh, telling her husband Bruce about these funny names, as something must have struck a chord because Bruce, like ran to his office and started like frantically going through his files and his paperwork when he found what he's looking for which was an official uh, list of men killed from the vc-81 squadron aboard the natoma bay and what do you know these names included james houston's three squadron mates who had been killed in 1944 prior to his own death in 45 and their names were billy peeler walter devlin and leon connor Ooh. You know what people really should be trying to keep track of how many times they say kids are fucking creepy in this episode because <laughs> why are all these kids so fucking creepy? It's just like in that's their nature. crazy. It's, it's in nature. their nature. Mm-hmm. Kids know all the paranormal stuff. They remember things we don't remember. It's just like they They're sensitive. They're fresh. They're a lot. They're fresh to this world. <laughs> they're fresh. They're fresh and yummy. They're fresh. <laughs> I'm s- this whole time, I was telling Nicole before we came back on, I keep rubbing my diaper. <laughs> so you're rubbing like my belly because these diapers go like right under your boobs. So I just keep she's talking, and this whole time, I'm just rubbing my belly. <laughs> so I had to say it's fresh. It's fresh rubbing that belly. <laughs> mm. What's that from? Like, um, was it Austin Powers Gold Member or something? <laughs> Where he's like, get in uh, my belly. <laughs> oh. Can't get hotter. Well, yep, Can't get hotter. It. So, yeah. So, he's got these creepy-ass dolls with the names of the squadron mates that had been killed. Billy, Walter, and, and Leon. And that's that's crazy. That's um, insane. I'm going to give you a couple other sort of random instances in which James's proclamations sort of rung true um, in sort of, like, bullet point style. So, mm-hmm. first, James had said that Corsair planes had two defects. They often got flat tires and they wanted to turn left when they took off. And he was correct. Interesting. The Corsair's poor sight lines and heavy engines made for an unusually rough landing on carrier decks, which blew an inordinate number of tires. Uh, And the exceptional torque from their single front mounter prop caused a drift to the left on takeoff. Um, And James Houston was a test pilot for Corsair, so he would know to note these defects. Yeah. Wild. Insane. Wild. Number one, wild. Number two, wild. (laughs) While touring the Nimitz, the Nimitz, Nimitz, I don't know how to pronounce that. While touring the Nimitz Museum, he saw a five-inch cannon and announced that it was just like the gun on the fantail of the Natoma Bay. And the USS Natoma Bay did indeed have a five-inch cannon on its fantail. I mean, this is a lot of shit for a kid. Yeah, that's just, yeah, that's a lot. I can barely remember. I'm reading off my notes. (laughs) Yeah. Um, so in 2004, when James was six, a little older, but still smaller, Mm -hmm. while watching a TV show about Corsairs, James corrected the narrator by pointing out that the Japanese plane seeing being shot down was a Tony and not a Zero. 
and he went on to explain that the Tony was a Japanese fighter that was smaller than a Zero, and these corrections were also accurate. This kid's a genius. Wild. Third wild. <laughs> um, they went to a reunion of the Natoma Bay pilots, and James apparently recognized one of the pilots as Bob Greenwald just by his voice. Wild. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so I want to talk a little bit more about James Houston's sister that I sort of glossed over a little bit a bit ago because uh, I had mentioned that she had revealed the photo of Houston yeah. in front of the Corsair. Now, we can go through all of the details that I just took you through and essentially explain them all away. Yes, they are incredible, but it's not completely out of the question that the boy's parents could have been feeding him all this information for fame. Yeah. You know, did they, they did end up writing a bestseller book about it. You know, don't get me wrong. There are 100% some child prodigies out there that are insanely intelligent and have the capacity to memorize and retain, like, an incredible amount of information. You know, we've seen it. They're on Oprah yeah. and shit. Was James Leininger one of these? Maybe. Maybe. Uh, but I feel like we would have heard more about how intelligent he was about other topics. Yeah. Like, this is very specific. I was just... But do they um, have... Was it the father who said he was researching to show that this couldn't happen because of God? Did he tell people that? Or did people actually know him to say that? Like, was he, like, going out before he became famous? Like, oh, my kid thinks he's reincarnated, but that's what I'd want to know. Or is the dad saying he was the one trying to debunk it, and then he believed it and kind of went out there? You know? I don't know. I think the dad was. I think the mom was a little bit more on board right away. It may have been more like yeah. that. Andrea. So, I don't know. She, but yeah. even if, I don't know. I don't, I don't know, know either. It sounds pretty legit, though. I mean, he he was fed lots of leading questions, and he was encouraged to embrace this mm-hmm. past identity. And, you know, kids' imaginations, they could, yeah. you know, they could run wild. Maybe he took all this information that he was being fed and, and his parents were encouraging and just kind of ran with it. Absolutely, sure. Um, but the following story about James Houston's sister really hits okay. home for me in personally believing this little boy. So, again... His sister's name was Anne Barron, who was 86 at the time of meeting uh, just five-year-old James. He's five at this point that he met the sister. During their very first telephone conversation, he called her Annie, even though his mom thought it disrespectful. And we find out that only her long-dead brother, James Houston Jr., ever called her Annie. Wow. So he also said that she had a sister named Ruth, which if you're four, you can't pronounce T-A, so Ruth. Ruth, Ruth, who was four years older than she was. And she did indeed have a now deceased sister who was four years older. They also talked intimately and at length about how their dad, James Houston Sr., was an alcoholic and the devastating effects that it had on their family. I mean, like, (laughs) we both have five-year-olds. What five-year-old knows what alcoholism is? Like... (laughs) He's, I'll, I'll just walk around like, this is a devastating death <laughs> in my family. <laughs> I couldn't. No, I mean, my five-year-old yeah, does That's crazy. I, I, agree. I mean, no. Violet knows what drinking too much beer means, but like in a literal sense. Like she doesn't yeah. know that it has psychological and physical effects uh, and that it can be addictive and yada, yada, yada. Like it might as well be water to her. Like, oh, you drank too much beer. Oh, yeah. you drank too much water. Same thing. You know, same yeah. difference. Yeah, Ella says, yeah, she calls it what she call it daddy soda daddy soda <laughs> no violet that's you know that's a fun real daddy soda <laughs> that's cute violet knows that that daddy likes beer where's daddy going he's going to get is daddy going to get beer from the, from the convenience store <laughs> she, she would have the alabama accent daddy can i get you oh. beer just kidding <laughs> just kidding <laughs> um okay <laughs> So Alabama girl, this last this last piece is what does it for me. So in this conversation that he had with Anne, a little James ended up asking Anne about what happened to a very specific painting that was painted by their mother. The painting, which nobody else knew about, was in their attic. And this blew her away. Like nobody else would have known yeah. about that painting that their mother painted. And it's sitting in an attic. And this one was 86. Like, and how old was he? Six or eight? Six. Then? He was six. Six? Oh, it's crazy. Like, yeah. yeah. Again, like, he could have been fed all this other information. If you want to really explain it all the way, mm-hmm. how would he have known about this painting? That's yeah. what puts the nail in it for me is, like, this painting, really. Like, 
we can play the devil's advocate and say maybe his parents bribed this woman to say all this for money but like really like what does an 86 year old woman need to be bribed for <laughs> like yeah you're kicking the bucket fairly soon you don't give a shit you don't yeah. care no and this is we're talking about her dead shit anymore. brother like you think she'd mm-hmm. put dis- disrespect on his name like that no <laughs> No. no. So, uh, around the same time uh, when James was six, ABC contacted the Line Anglers again, asking if they would be interested in participating in a segment for ABC Primetime hosted by Chris Cuomo. Uh, by this time, Houston had been identified and all the further ad- evidence had been found. So, of course, they were like, oh, now we really do want to talk to you. Your case is strong. Um, mm-hmm. And the segment was broadcast on April 15th of 2004. Um, And it obviously generated further media attention, including, like, articles, major newspapers, worldwide, TV reports. Yeah. Like, it just took off. So, impressed by the strength of the case now, Tucker, who has this whole strength of case. Our boy Tuck. Uh Uh-huh. Tuck's back. He sees his strength of case now. (laughs) He's like, I'm going to contact them again. So, at first, they were willing to be interviewed, uh, but then they just got overwhelmed by all the media attention. And they decided to publish James's story as a book and they just like temporarily declined only in 2010 when James yeah. was about 12 was when Dr. T- Tucker was finally able to interview the family so enter Tucky boy what's your boy doing again this is when James is a little older I'm kind of disappointed that Dr. Tucker wasn't able to talk to him when he was like yeah. in the middle of all this shit like come on this is the well, guy you said you he had to talk he... to fuck yeah. this woman with the past regression and yeah, talk to talk. Tucker. Well, it's one of these things where I guess didn't you say he did have the paperwork? He did know of it, but he kind of just set it aside. So you know, he, he probably gets yeah. that. You know, yeah. Our boy Tuck, like we know him. We know him. This guy's working hard. That's true. You know, <laughs> he's, a he's a busy guy. guy. He's a busy guy. You know, <laughs> it's not his fault. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Um, so obviously he's able to finally dig his claws into this case and he ended up writing an informal account of the case as a chapter in his 2013 book uh which is called return to life extraordinary cases of children who remember past lives Um, and then he published a formal case report in 2016. he noted that while the leininger's original written records of the case were lost the fact that James made the statements before Houston had been identified was proved both by video footage Tucker had received from ABC back in 2002 and by written materials such as dated internet printouts confirming that Bruce had searched for the information on the Gentoba Bay mm-hmm. back in you know 2000, like Ask Jeeves style. Um, and he engaged in correspondence to find Jack Larson. So he's saying like if the Leinigers were creating this complex fraud Tucker argued that they would surely have presented as good a case to ABC in 2002 mm-hmm. as they did in 2004, you know, not knowing that they would have another media opportunity. And other grounds to doubt fraud as an explanation, Tucker argued, were the length of time the case took to develop and the number of people involved in the investigation, all of whom would have had to be conspiring together. Yeah. <laughs> like the sister, all of the pilots, like all these people. It's a lot. Tucker also ruled out fantasy since James's persistent nightmares and behaviors such as repeatedly, you know, crashing the toys and the planes and his pain filled drawings were more characteristic of children who had suffered traumas than children fantasizing. The traumatic traumatic trauma. trauma. (laughs) Permanent trauma. Um, With regard to coincidence, Tucker considered the possibility of such detailed statements exactly matching the identity and circumstances of a particular deceased individual by pure chance to be like implausibly small tiny tiny chance um tucker noted that all the documented statements leading to the identification of houston were made by james himself he could not have read about houston or the natoma bay nor could he have been exposed to any television program on these topics and his parents and other people around him had no knowledge of them because it wasn't like a popular story there were so many stories like that in world war ii Like, there's so many deaths. Yeah. Yeah. It would be hard to find this exact one. Yep. So, fast forward some years later, there is this video. And you can look it up, too. Maybe we could probably post a link to it. Um, When James was 11, a Japanese TV station paid the family's passage to Chichijima, the small island nearest the spot that Houston died, from where they traveled in a fishing boat to visit the exact site. 
Uh, the Leiningers performed a memorial service, and James was essentially like beside himself as his dad said some words in the memorial. He was just bawling the entire time. It was hard, yeah. actually hard to watch this kid. Like he was clearly mm-hmm. taken aback by this whole situation. Um, like again, he, he was crying the entire time, and he threw a bouquet of flowers into the sea, and he said goodbye to James Houston. And you're like, oh my god. Um. In the video, he says, like, he says, I hope that it helped people understand the meaning of how precious life is, how fast it can just blow away, and I hope that it opens people's eyes up to reincarnation. I hope it opens people's eyes up to the fact that reincarnation can happen. It is a possibility. It's not a lie. And the trip to that site of the fatal accident appeared to be, you know, bring about sort of a healing catharsis for him as his drawings afterwards became less destructive and chaotic. And again, he's older Mm -hmm. now. He's age 11. So I imagine memories start fading a bit. Well, it sounds like... He was still drawing, It sounds like the kids that are experiencing this, it's like you start losing the memories the older you get. It seems very similar to the other stories. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So. Yep. Yep. So um, not too much longer than that. In a 2012 segment on Fox and Friends, um, James Discott... Sorry, hang on. Oh, I, gotta burp. Oh, I thought Fox and Friends was making her throw up. I got a non burp. <laughs> <laughs> and also, if anybody knows me, I'm not actually burping because I do not know how to burp. Yeah. So it was just like air stuck in my chest. <laughs> she just does a fun face. All right. Fast forward. No, rewind. <laughs> in a 2012 segment on Fox and Friends, um, James described how the nightmares ceased after a sort of like spiritual release he experienced at the site of the crash back, you know, when they aired that video. Um, and James goes on to suggest that reincarnation can be the source of what seems like innate knowledge. He adds that he, he occasionally remembers his past life, but is moving forward with his current one. And that seems to be sort of the last update. The fucking end. Yeah, I believe it. I believe that one. If there was reincarnation. People are torn about really? this one. There are some there are some haters over this one. And I have not read the book, full disclosure, but I read that people that have read the book seem to think that the mom Andrea is sort of like it seems like she kind of goes off and talks more about her family than the case and is kind of treating it like her book and they're just kind of like yeah just gave them just the book kind of gave them an icky feeling about the parents and maybe that's kind of taken over the evidential stuff yeah 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 so yeah needless to say there's uh there's been a decent amount of skepticism on the case and Lots of people claim the parents fed the child information and that he was just a sponge, you know, which is true. Children are sponges, but, like, to this degree, I don't know. No. Like, my five-year-old is pretty smart, but sometimes she can't even remember what she had for lunch at school the same day. So, this kid, is he a prodigy? I don't know. So, a last, you know, note on the case uh, that I wanted to, to say is, uh, it's a note on a commentary that Dr. Tucker released in the Journal of Scientific Exploration, in response to a man named Michael, I don't know how to say his name, Sudath, Sudath, Michael, he's a hater. That's all you need to know. Michael Sudath's examination of the case and Dr. Tucker's findings. Oh, we don't like haters around here. We don't like no haters around here. We don't like no haters. So this is what Dr. Tucker has to say about Michael's skepticism. He says, in the last journal issue, Michael Sudath, 2021, presented a re-examination of the case of James Leininger, who as a young boy appeared to remember the life of James Houston, a pilot killed during World War II. Michael clearly put a tremendous amount of time into exploring the case. Unfortunately, his report is filled with distortions, mischaracterizations, and at times outright misinformation. There are too many instances to list every one, but large and small, they all contribute to an inaccurate picture that denigrates the credibility of James's parents as informants and my competence as a researcher. And then he goes on to list James's statements and behaviors like one by one, addressing each of Michael's criticisms. And I won't go through all these because it's long and we just did. Um, but it's fascinating. And I will link everybody to the journal on our socials um, because... It, it's a good like bullet point to, sure. to all this guys you know if you have skepticism read this and then you can read what dr tucker was like bitch no say yeah. look boom, 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 boom. 
So uh, if anyone doesn't know by now, we do have an Instagram and a Facebook and everything we talk about in our cases or on our show or we say we're going to link, just go right there and you'll have everything for our show. Yes. Yeah. We try our best. And each case, which is super fun. Yeah. Each episode. Yes. Yeah. Um, so Nicole will put this and tons of stuff I want to read too because I am very excited right yeah, now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And that's not even it. So that's just the story of James Leininger, mm-hmm. believe it or not. So the last story here may just be my favorite. I'm going to give you a tiny little backstory here. This story originally aired on my favorite podcast, Two Girls, One Ghost, in one of their Encounters episodes from 2022, last year. Um, And it just like stuck with me, this one. Um, Is it like a listener's tale or was it one It's a listener's story. Yep. Their Encounters episodes are all listener stories, just like our Show Us Your Booze. Um, so as far as I know, this has not been read anywhere else except Two Girls, One Ghosts. So Sabrina read the story, and I remember reacting with the same gasps as Corinne in the story. If you follow Two Girls, One Ghost, you know what I'm talking about. Um, and ever since we started Girls Gone Weird, I always knew I wanted to do a reincarnation episode. I mean, I've been talking about it for a while, um, if not multiple episodes, because let's be honest, there's a lot oh, of them. Sure. Um, while I was doing my research for previous cases this week, I thought, hmm, like, I wonder if I could find that woman who told her story on TGOG and, like, see if she would let me read hers on ours. Yep. So, <laughs> spoiler alert, she said yes. Um, I, <laughs> I went and re-listened to that whole episode just to find her name. And then I went in the Two Girls, One Ghost fan group searched her name searched through post to see if i could find her fucking found her sent her a message not really expecting it and boom yeah again she said yes and i'm so jacked so she okay what well what oh whoever you are you're badass i am sorry <laughs> i am sorry i have had too much medicine Sit your crunchy ass down don't scold me don't scold me <laughs> it's coming at me hot tonight <laughs> um okay so she also included some details that she previously had unintentionally left out when she emailed tgog uh so if there's any listeners of that podcast that want to skip this one because they've heard it i implore you not to um plus it's just so good i could listen to it over and over again so Without further ado, here is the unbelievable story from Elise in none other than our homeland, Minnesota, which is a total coincidence, by the way. I always want to say skull, even though I'm not a football fan. I just know that's like the Vikings. Like, do Minnesotans have any other way to identify with each other? Oh, I... Like... No. I'm... (laughs) No. (laughs) What are you going to say? Like, uh... Uh, <laughs> I'm trying to think of something Minnesota to say. All I can think of is Ufta. Ufta, yes, that's what I was thinking. What's Ufta? Yep, that I did. But like even then, that's up here though. <laughs> like, so I never heard this until because I'm not from a Norwegian family. There's a lot of Norwegians around, you know, the state, but I'm just not. And yeah. so, we, yeah. and I'm from the city, so we never heard that. It was, like, not a family thing. And then as soon as I moved up north, I was like, oof da oof I'm like, what the fuck are you all talking about? And now it's all I hear. You had never heard that? Not in my life until <laughs> I moved up here. Oofda. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I suppose I have a lot of family from way up, yep. you know, Red Lake, Leech Lake, Bemidji, like, all over the north. So I'm like, yeah, I'll say oof Um like, I was driving next to a car the other day. You know, again, I live in Alabama, and I was driving in Birmingham. And from, like, four cars up on the left, what I saw what I thought looked like a tiny little Minnesota sticker, but I couldn't tell because I was so far. And I, like, intentionally tried to, like, mm-hmm. drive faster to get closer to see if it was. And I looked at it, and I, boom, it was a fucking Minnesota Ooh. sticker. It was the outline of the yeah. state. And in that moment, I wanted to be, like, like waving my hands frantically like to be like oh i'm from minnesota too but like what do you say like cool should i roll down the window and be like school nicole like, Oof, duh. nicole's also showing her window being rolled down like it's the 90s and it's one of those <laughs> yeah i'm rolling my window down roll it, <laughs> roll it down to the button like i'm in my 98 buick yeah. <laughs> like hold on <laughs> yeah. so yeah i don't know what i would have said if i 
if I met up with that car and just like roll the window down. Hi, I'm from Minnesota too. They'd probably be like, okay. I would be and... super pumped. I would be super pumped. So right, Minnesota cold. I mean, it's, uh, yeah, it's a country away. Yep. Okay. Anyway, sorry, Elise. We're gonna go on with your story now. I just had to talk about that. <laughs> okay. Here is her story. I'm going to read for you. I'm so excited. I'm so excited. You got okay. you pumped this I'm up. So excited. So. Right. Okay. So this story is about my young daughter, Nora, who has recently told me about her past life, and it's quite detailed. So cue the Anastasia soundtrack, and let's get ready for this journey to the past. I love the way she writes, yes. by the way. She writes how I write, like very cinematic. <laughs> I think Nicole's trying to take credit for how cool a writer you are. Look at this. That's true. <laughs> Just a little plug for myself. Just a plug out there. for herself. It's a lot of plugs. <laughs> all right. Lots of plugs in this yeah. episode. I'm getting cocky. You are getting cocky. <laughs> it's all these positive comments we're getting from people. Yep. I'm getting cocky. She <laughs> okay. She says I have three children, each with their own unique quirks, and Nora is my adorable, mysterious middle. When she was two and three, she would say some random sentences that I thought were uncommon for kids that age to say. She would sometimes call me mother, which I thought was a little too formal for my comfort. Hello, mother. <laughs> <It's formal. laughs> also, she would often say, I'm a boy, mom. I'm a boy. And thinking her growing brain was just not grasping the male-female concept, I would usually respond with, well, actually, you're a girl, but... Of course, you can be a boy if you want. Let's talk about it again in a few years. <laughs> you go, girl. That's the way to approach it. Um, but one day when she was four, she was talking to her older sister, Harriet, and things got a little interesting. I didn't overhear the beginning of the conversation, but I did hear Nora respond, yeah, like when I was a boy. And my interest suddenly peaked. I asked, when you were a boy, huh? When was this? Speaking as casually as if talking about her morning bowel movement, <laughs> Nora replied, Before I came here to be with you, I was a boy. Then I died when I was eight. I went to heaven, and then I came here to be with you. Fucking creepy-ass kids. <laughs> creepy-ass kids. Should just name, that should be the name of this creepy episode. Nora. Creepy Nora. Creepy-ass kids. Creepy-ass kids. <laughs> So she says, now I'm not necessarily a skeptic. However, I do know my four-year-old has a very wild imagination. So I began to ask questions and I tried to stay open-minded. When you were a boy, did you have a mom and a dad? Yes. Did they talk like we did or did they sound different, like a different language? Sort of like us in English, I think, but I don't talk like that anymore. What sort of clothes did you wear? I wore boy clothes, but when I was a baby, I wore dresses. What kind of clothes did your mommy wear? T-shirts and jeans like me? She wore a dress that was really tight and crisscrossed in the middle and then put a big dress on top of that one with a big bow. This was poofy yeah. on the bottom. At this point, I thought, mm, okay, well, Elsa or Anna could have easily influenced this, but I'll continue. What did your daddy wear? Casually, she answered, wedding clothes. But sometimes he wore a blue outfit with a blue hat and a gold metal eagle in the middle with its wings kind of up. And there were gold buttons down his front and he had big boots. Oof, okay, time for me to first start recording this <laughs> shit. <laughs> it's getting real. So how old is this kid, did you say? How Nora, old is this kid again? when she started talking about this, she was four. So younger than our girls. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And again, lots of details. A lot of details. I then proceeded to ask many more questions over the course of the next few weeks without trying to bother her too much. She told me her name was Abby, and despite me saying Abby was a girl's name, Nora was adamant her name was Abby when she was a boy. Her dad's name was Crew, and she couldn't remember her mom's name, but she thought it maybe sounded like her current brother's name, which is Frank. She was also adamant that there were two boys and two girls, so she had two sisters and one brother, because she was the other boy. She thought her sister's name was Lily, but couldn't remember the names of the other children. Side note, she does have a friend at daycare named Lily, so I took that with a grain of salt. She says she wasn't the oldest, but she wasn't the youngest either. She also had two dogs, and one was a small puppy. Her dad liked to wear his uniform and works on ships, and her mom liked to read books to people. She said she could see the ocean every day from her house. At this point, I'm very interested, but still hesitant because I know this little shit could be pulling my leg. Yep. <laughs> I asked her if she could draw her house for me, and she was excited about that. 
She draws up some cute little squares where everyone slept. She slept with her brother in one big bed and her sisters slept in bunk beds. When I asked where her mom and dad slept, she drew two beds. I asked if she meant to draw one bed and she said, no, they slept in separate beds. Unless I left the History Channel on, I don't think there's any way she would have known that husbands and wives used to sleep in separate beds. I did a quick Google search for when did couples sleep in separate beds, and the response was, for almost a century between the 1850s and 1950s, separate beds were seen as a healthier, more modern option for couples than the double. Honestly, I would not mind if this trend came back. (laughs) I am right there with you, girl. I want a separate house. (laughs) Yep. (laughs) I know. I was surprised, like, 1950s, I was surprised it wasn't that long ago. No. Like, I felt like, for some reason, I was thinking, like, probably ending, like, the 1800s or something. Because I always think of that, or I know that in movies, because I am such an old movie buff, like old musical buff, they'd always show the actor and actresses in separate beds, but mm-hmm. that was like movie law because they didn't yeah. want the like show that they might be having sex. Yeah, yeah. Because how dare Modesty. they? <laughs> a married, married couple. Yeah. Um, but yeah, no, I'm with you. I I like the idea of separate th- things separate beds. like that. Wouldn't wouldn't hurt. Yeah, yeah. Like let's, yeah, let's get this trend back. <laughs> Yeah. Two king beds right next to each other. There you go. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Spread out. Perfect. That's like a triple, double California king. I don't know what you'd call that. Bring that in. There's actually, my stepmom worked for um, a now criminal uh, who used to be a car dealer in Minnesota. In fact, um, everybody probably remembers who this was, including Elise Denny Hecker. Remember Denny Hecker? (laughs) The car? The car guy? Yeah. Yeah. He went to prison. Yep. Every commercial. Shit. Yeah. Yes. Um, but my stepmom was the house manager for him. So sometimes I would go to their huge mansion when she, like, cleaned their house and did their thing. And I'd get to, like, run around this mansion. And they had done that, essentially. They had put two kings right next to each other to make one just giant Genius. bed. And the house, the bedroom looked over, like, the lake. And it was just like, oh, I wanted that room. So cool. It is genius. You just need a giant. Genius. You just need a giant bed to do it. Or a giant bedroom. Yep to fit them in anyway love that trend okay back to the story elise says anyway i decided that if this story was real i was going to try and figure out the date when my daughter was a boy named abby and right now i've got it narrowed down to a century between 1850 and 1950 so since women's fashion is most notable over the years i made a collage of women's clothing styles through the decades and a second collage of women's hairstyles through the decades, both dated from the 1800s to the 1950s. I didn't put dates on the pictures just in case she could read them, even though she can't read at that age, but now I'm second-guessing everything. Yeah. <laughs> I asked her to point to what her mommy used to wear and how her hair used to look. She looked at both collages for a while and picked out 1870s clothing styles and 1880s hairstyles interesting still thinking this could be a pretty big coincidence i asked her if she lived in the united states and she nods then i asked her if she knew who the president was i mean she does recognize trump uh but who doesn't right yeah (laughs) so maybe if there was another notable president in her era she might remember him she nods her head again so i pull up a poster of the u.s presidents she studies it for a long time and then points affirmatively to ulysses s grant and Grant served from, guessed it, 1869 to 1877. Yep. He was most known for being commanding general of the Union Army before his presidency. And according to Nora, her dad was a huge fan of him. <laughs> <laughs> so just to confirm that this isn't an insane coincidence, I waited a week and I showed Nora a poster of the presidents again. But this time I picked a different poster with different character styles. She studies it the same way, and sure as shit, she points to Grant once again, and she slowly rolls her eyes at me and says, Mom, I already told you it was him. (laughs) I love this little girl. She sounds just as sassy as her mom does. (laughs) Yep. (laughs) After I picked my jaw up off the floor, I brought in a map of the United States and asked if she could point out which state she lived in. Again, she's four, so I thought this might be a long shot. But what the hell? She picked out Grant twice. Why not a state? She started to point her finger towards Minnesota, but then retracted and said, no, that's where I live now. I lived in the roundish one. Here, this one. And she slams her finger on Maine. 
Maine, I ask. She smiles brightly. Yes, Maine. Do you remember what city or town in Maine? Um, east. So I bring up a map of Maine and ask her to point to where she thought it might have been. Her tiny little finger circles an area on the bay and right smack dab under her finger is freaking Eastport, Maine. This girl can't read. Uh, yeah. <laughs> we live in Minneapolis and have never been to or talked about Maine. I researched the history of Eastport and it is a cute little port city of a couple thousand residents with gorgeous ocean views. Remember she had mentioned seeing her and that ocean from her home every day. Yeah. Uh, they were known for building clipper ships and being the easternmost city in the United States, right on the Canadian border. So this is nuts. My daughter was a boy around the 1870s slash 1880s and lived in Eastport, Maine with two sisters and a brother. So now, curious about her name, I went on a few baby name websites to look up the name Abby. Well, guess what? Abby was a popular boy's name back in 1850 to 1900, usually as a nickname for Abner. What the fuck? Yeah. Because that's, that's not a popular name for males. Like, I've never even thought of that as a masculine no. name. No. Yeah. And, and it makes sense, a nickname for Abner, you know? Yeah. Just, wow. So... She says, after I read that, I had a flashback to when Nora's sister Harriet was teaching her to write her name. Nora would say, my name starts with A. And Harriet would say, no, Nora ends with A. It starts with N. And Nora would just storm off so frustrated and scream, it starts with A. Like, ignorant me just chopped yeah. it up to dyslexia. Because, <laughs> of course, mm -hmm. you'd think, like, N, A, like, makes sense. That's mm -hmm. what you would think. And kids at that age are just psychos. So they are about they get mad about the weirdest things. Yeah, <laughs> we have no pickles left. <laughs> I'm gonna flip this fucking table over. <laughs> that age is rough. <laughs> All right, so she says we started to notice so many other instances where she could verify the lifestyles of the 1800s. Probably the creepiest was when the kids got a marble set for Christmas, which included plastic connector pieces to create towers for the marbles to go down. Nora especially loved this, so I asked if she played with the marbles when she was a boy. She responded with, Yes, but the marbles didn't look like this, and we didn't have this stuff. Her hands waving over the plastic connector pieces. We would sit on the floor with a big circle and try to flick the marbles like this into the circle to bounce other marbles out of the circle. There was one big marble and other smaller marbles. She just sat there and taught us all how to play marbles. Like, the original yeah. marbles. Original marbles, yeah. yeah. I would make, if I was her parent, I would make Nora live in the basement. <laughs> <laughs> By herself. Here you go, Abby. <laughs> I'm like, you just go down there. Go be creepy down there. <laughs> you sound like your mother. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so... Here are some other what the fuck moments, and these are bullet point style again. One day while talking about horses, she told us how she used to ride horses, but her mom and her sisters had to ride side saddle because they were ladies and they had such poofy dresses. Accurate. Yeah. Yep. She also talked about swimming at a pool, and her swimsuit was long shorts but came up over her shoulders too. Fucking accurate. Yeah. Later, when we were having milk one day, she told us how milk came in glass jars in Maine, not jugs, and she didn't get it at the store. A nice milkman dropped it off at her door. <laughs> These are just blowing my mind still. When I asked her what kind of food she liked to eat, she said French food, and then described a warm sandwich pie with crumbly meat inside, which I'm assuming is a mincemeat pie or a tortier, which... Yeah. According to Google, is a very traditional French-Canadian food. And of course, Eastport, Maine is right next door neighbors to Canada. Uh, then there was a story about how she fell down and lost three teeth. And she pointed to the three teeth she lost. Yet she has not lost any teeth in this lifetime. Mm -hmm. <laughs> when I asked about her school, she said it was white with a bell on the outside. And inside, there were three classrooms with older kids, too. I looked up the historical school of Eastport, and it only had one classroom. However... In 1875, there was a rapid growth in the small town, and the school was renovated to hold three classrooms and included upper-level students. Wild. That is wild. <laughs> wild. This is fucking wild. 
Now, there's no doubt in my mind, even my skeptical husband mind, that she actually has memories of these experiences from the 1800s. I recently asked her if she remembered how and when she died because I thought maybe, like just maybe, I could find an actual person related to this. Yeah. When I first asked Nora how she died, she was very reserved and didn't want to talk about it. So I didn't push it until one day she decided to tell me. She said she was eight years old, standing in the living room, and the chandelier fell on top of her and her puppy she was holding. She pointed Aww. to her, I know. She pointed to her tummy and said, something in here broke and the doctor couldn't fix it, and she and her puppy died. <laughs> I said, oh, I'm so sorry, Nora. Your family must have been really sad. She got really somber and said, yes, but they put a candle on a plate and floated it in the ocean for me, and it made me really happy. I stayed and I watched them until they died when they were old. Harriet said, oh, cool, so you were a ghost in your house? And Nora got so offended and said, no, I was not a ghost. I was an angel, a beautiful angel. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love this girl. Do you think that, like, us calling, like, the like dead people ghosts, like, we're just, like, oh, we're to go ghost hunting or, like, ghost hunters going and things, they're like, I'm a fucking angel. I'm a beautiful angel. <laughs> <laughs> Stop calling me ghost. We're going to angel hunting. <laughs> um, she said, I spent a few days trying to figure out exact dates and realized she was more willing to talk about her death when we were having a midnight snack before bed. Yes, she totally manipulated me, but it was worth it. <laughs> Those little kids at that age are so yep. manipulative. <laughs> they still are. They are. They, they still are. Um, <laughs> side note, because I will be talking about actual people I found on Ancestry.com and FindAGrave.com, I thought it would be best to slightly change names and dates. I don't yeah. want to offend any living relatives in any way. So, when I asked her if she remembered her birthday, she easily rattled off January 21st, which is not her current birthday. Then she said she died in spring of 1889. So, knowing she died when she was eight... I wanted to test her a little to see if she could pick out her birth year. I said, were you born in 1883? No. 82? No. 81? Yes. 80? No, mom, I said 81. 81! <laughs> Clearly, I am in deep now, so I neglected my paying job responsibilities for a few days. I hope my boss doesn't listen to this podcast. I, paid... I would too. This is all I would be doing. <laughs> totally. <laughs> I paid for a month subscription to Ancestry.com and all related sites, and I spent some long hours doing research. Mm -hmm. I did search for the whole state of Maine in case he was born outside of Eastport. I searched for an Abner born on January 21st, 1881, dying in 1889. The search brought up about 50 hits. Not bad. There were only a handful of Abners as a first name, and the dates ranged close to those dates Nora listed, but not exactly. Most of them sadly died in fires, um, but there was one Abner who was born in Portland, Maine in 1880 and died in Washington County in, 19, in 1888, but the death certificate said died from eating poison berries. Sad, but not my Abner. Mm -hmm. uh, the rest of the Abners were middle names. Eventually, I reached one that stuck out to me. He was born in January 1881 and died in April, spring 1889. This was the only Abner with those exact dates, and guess what city he was born and died in? Yep, Eastport, Maine. Mm. His full name was Frank Abner Cook. The parents' names were different from what Nora recalled, but they were originally born in Canada, and the dad was in the Civil War and enlisted in the Navy. This was all starting to align, except I noticed on the mother's death certificate that she had ten children. Holy fuck. <laughs> That's a lot of kids. Back in the day. Jesus. So I thought that that was the end of the line and that all that searching was for nothing. However, when I looked at the dates, there were only four children alive when Frank Abner lived and died. Two girls and two boys. What? Chills. Fucking wild. 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 Unfortunately, the death certificate had cause of death unmarked, but I guess death by chandelier might be uncommon to indicate. And on that note, when Nora was two, she used to wake up with night terrors screaming bloody murder that her legs hurt. She did this every night for a solid four or five months. It got so bad I once took her to the ER at 2 a.m. saying that her legs are hurting her and she won't stop screaming. The doctor chalked it up to growing pains, which are typical. Uh, I have the utmost respect for doctors, but something told me it wasn't growing pains. 
Anyway, flash forward to a few weeks ago, I was talking to another mom about Nora's painful legs, and this mom asked if I thought if it had anything to do with her past life. I had never put the two together. Yeah. It could be very likely that she was reliving that life when a chandelier fell on her and maybe it paralyzed her or crushed her legs. Who knows? Anyway, the four children's names were Harry, Frank, Lillian, and Martha. So she was right about Lily. Ironically mm-hmm. and sort of eerily, my other two children's names are Harriet, who we call Harry occasionally, and Frank. I mean, like, what are the chances? Yeah, that's, that's, that's a little strange. That is weird. That is a weird mm-hmm. coincidence. The dad was Adam, but he was a crew member of multiple ships, and he worked in the harbor after his time in the Navy. So maybe that's where the name crew came from, maybe? The grandfather's name was also Frank, so perhaps Frank Jr. went by Abner or Abby instead? Mm. Yep, you hear about that a lot. Usually, like, if they're named the same, you know, kind of just yep. do a nickname mm-hmm. or use the middle name. Exactly, yep. yep. All of this is, of course, speculation, but so many things seem to make sense that I find it almost hard not to believe it. <laughs> Even her daycare teachers have told me that she's not like a normal toddler. In her recent report card, they wrote, Nora seems to be taking it all in. She is so patient, kind, and she has the best posture. I swear she is an old soul. <laughs> yep. <laughs> well, little do they know how <laughs> right they are. <laughs> mm-hmm. When she was an infant, her nickname at daycare was Clumsy Cherub. She would always run into things, and her crawling was the most awkward thing I've ever seen. It was as if she was angry that she had to crawl and just wanted to stand up. She'd slam her hands on the floor and try to go as fast as she could. I guess her old soul was frustrated being stuck in such a little body again. (laughs) Also weird, on the day she was born, I had this overwhelming feeling that she would die young and tragically. It was such a strong feeling that I even told my husband. He just brushed it off as just that natural protective mommy feeling, but I never had that with my other kids. The feeling eventually went away, and after hearing all these stories from Nora, I wonder if instead it was a premonition, like I was just feeling... Oh, you're going to scare me. I was like, please don't happen to something happen to Nora. Please don't no, happen no. to Nora. No, oh. no. Nora's safe. Nora's safe. Oh. Okay. She, she said, I wonder if instead it was just a premonition. I was just feeling like residual energy from her past life. Mm-hmm. At least that's what I hope the mama feeling Mm -hmm. yeah yep so interestingly enough we had actually planned a family trip to maine six months before we heard nora's story and as this trip approached we had hoped to learn a little bit more than we originally planned from our tiny tour guide crazy coincidence or the universe working its magic yeah side note she did not hear us mention maine at all i only ever talked about it after the kids went to bed and via email with my sister So there's no way her daughter heard about this main trip and just took it and ran with it, you know. Unfortunately, the main trip was not quite as exciting as we had hoped. Uh, When she told us she was from Eastport, Maine, I was determined to make that part of our trip. And when we told Nora that we were going to Maine, she got a little weird and like nervous. Hmm. Uh, Once we landed, she was very quiet and took it all in. On our drive to our Verbo, she said, I remember these big trees indeed. I love these trees. Yes, she says indeed a lot. (laughs) Uh, We were staying in Portland for a week, and Eastport was about four and a half hours away, but I didn't care at all. I was ready to explore Eastport with Abby. The day we were ready to go, my mom stopped me and asked me, Do you think Nora even wants to go to Eastport? I admittedly and selfishly didn't even think about that. Mm -hmm. So I went to go ask her. When I did ask her, her eyes welled up and she said, I don't want to go back there again. Please, let's not go. I wasn't Mm -hmm. even thinking about what this would do to her. I was just excited to expand on her story. Mm -hmm. So in the end, we didn't want to make her uncomfortable and we respected her wishes. Uh, So we ended up taking her to the beach instead. And while there, she told me she remembered this beach and pointed to the pier and said, but this wasn't there. I thought that was strange because this was a historic pier. However, I googled it, and the pier was built in 1898, which was after Abby died. On the way back to the house, she told me stories about how her mom used to take her to the lake with a little blue wooden canoe, and she loved it because her siblings didn't like the canoe as much, so she got quality time with her mom. The next day, we took a trip to Salem, which was amazing. Obviously, oh my god, I want to go there so bad. So bad. Yes. Maybe we should do that. If we, if we become rich and famous from this podcast, we'll go to Salem. No. Just send us money to go to Salem. Send us, we'll, do, we'll crowdsource this trip to Salem. <laughs> <laughs> um, we toured the Ropes Mansion, which is Allison's house in Hocus Pocus. Yabos. Yabos. 
Yeah, she likes your yabos. <laughs> I can love that movie. It's a great movie. It is. Um, and that house has been turned into a museum, perfectly preserving the ropes' as family home in the 19th century. My other two kids were zooming around like typical bored little kids in a museum while Nora slowly walked through each room with me in awe of all the artifacts. She was so excited when she saw the four-poster bed and said that her mom and dad each had one of these beds in their rooms. She said, except the curtains yeah. weren't blue like this. They were red with flowers. And one of the two guys gave us a, a look. <laughs> like a quite like, oh. <laughs> what's this kid talking about? Mm -hmm. Did you just hear that? No. I actually burped. Oh, she did it. And it's did we, recorded. It's recorded? It was like in the middle recorded. of a word. Good for you. Oh my god, I'm so happy. I'm gonna have to rewind that. You're gonna have to mark <laughs> and it. I should I should um I should <laughs> like cut it up and like replay it over and over. So it's just like burp, 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 burp. <laughs> Um editor's note, I tried to isolate this burp, but it was so unimpressive that I could not do it successfully and it would have made no sense. And I'm really sad and I wanted to make a beat out of it, so I'm sorry if that's what you were expecting. I will try to burp again another time. It's going to make you feel so happy. Oh, oh I'm proud gosh. of you. Nicole never burps. Thank you. Oh, good I'm for so you. proud of myself, I know. too. I'm excited for you. This is a big deal. This is a super big yep. deal. <laughs> I'm not going <laughs> to cut it. I'm not going to cut that out. <laughs> okay. Be yes. proud of it. So, again. So, curtains were blue like this. They were red with flowers and one of the tour guys behind us gave us quite the look insert burp compilation here <laughs> burp. <laughs> um that is all i have from the main trip unfortunately and she has been talking about it less and less she recently turned six and i think is sadly forgetting but she does still have an amazing etiquette that we certainly didn't teach her and she still says some oddly grown-up phrases that we get a kick out of I'm happy I have a lot of it written down so we can talk it, talk about it again when she's older. Maybe over a bottle of wine. And this, that says she's six, so I think she's about eight now, because that was in 20... No, that was last year, so she's about seven now. Um, whether this was all just a crazy coincidence, an elaborate tale from a creative toddler, or an actual past life, I have been blown away, and I have learned a lot of history along the way. P.S. Here's another Nora story I wanted to share with you. It's not past life related, but paranormal and fun. So one day I was having a shitty mom day. And the kids were being awful all day and there was not enough wine in the house to keep me at peace. Yep. That evening, all three <laughs> kids were fighting and screaming in Harriet's bedroom. I was in Nora's bedroom putting away endless amounts of laundry when I just couldn't take it anymore. I dropped my laundry basket, landed on my knees and just started crying. I recently lost both of my grandmothers. So I looked up at the ceiling and I yelled, damn it, Grammy and Nanny. How the hell did you do this with all your kids and still rock a smile? I just can't mom anymore and stay a sane person and I'm a horrible mom. Which we've all fucking gone through. Yeah, we have. We've all done it. All, yeah. Uh, I suddenly heard the screaming kids come rushing into the room I was in. So I quickly stood up, brushed away my tears and just got my game face back on before they came in. No one saw or heard my little meltdown. I went back into being mean mommy mode and angrily made all the kids clean up their bedrooms until they were spotless. <laughs> I remember thinking it was the first time I saw their floors in years. Everything was put away. Everything. And then everyone went to bed. The next morning, I went to wake up Nora and get her ready for the day. After she got up, she immediately went to the floor right where I had my previous meltdown. And there on the floor were two little gems sparkling in the sunlight. She nonchalantly picked them up and gave them to me and said, These are from Grammy and Nanny. They wanted to make you happy. I had no words, Aww. but my oldest who came in the room said, but those aren't from Grammy and Nanny. They came from Target. <laughs> <laughs> and Nora responded, yes, I know, but they are from Grammy and Nanny as a gift for you, Mom. They told me. <laughs> I told my mom this story, and she thinks it was my grandma's wanting me to know that I was still a gem of a mom, even with my awful meltdown. A week or so later, my sister called me to tell me she wasted money on a psychic reading. <laughs> She told me how she asked the psychic if our grandparents had any signs or symbols for us so we could know they were still around us. Heidi said, none of it made any sense. The psychic said my grandpa was a cardinal. So typical. 
Our step-grandpa was just a sense of knowing he was around and my grandma's symbols were like diamonds or something sparkly. Heidi was like, that doesn't even make sense. (laughs) But then I went on to tell her my gem story and she said, oh crap, maybe I should have hung up on that psychic man. Shit. (laughs) Oh, that's sweet. Isn't it? That really is. All mamas have done that and I feel like we're starting to be more honest with each other about our breakdowns and our meltdowns and all that with women and you know our children and stuff like that but I feel like the grandmas and everything from back in the day pretended that didn't happen or everything's so perfect and so it's probably them showing like hey we've been there we got you now we love Mm -hmm. you yeah yeah I love that little end story Mm-hmm. Um, That's really she sweet. also said that she included Nora's drawings of her past like family for shits and giggles and we have included them in our episode post if you haven't seen it yet I think oh, I'm slipped awesome. in there um, mm-hmm. anyway yeah so any- I fucking love that story thank you so much for letting me revisit that Elise it was just so fucking yes. crazy thank you Elise that was absolutely awesome yeah so that is basically the end of the stories that I have um, that was an awesome story. Awesome, Nicole. Thank you. Thank you. I really, that last one is my favorite. Yeah. Like, I I like it straight love... from the source type of Yeah. I don't know if you noticed. I just noticed myself. I, I went from the whole episode, like, laying back casually in my chair reading to, like, when I got to her story, I'm, like, up in the microphone. I'm, like, yeah. fucking ready to tell it. <laughs> um, I love little Nora, and I love Elise. I feel like we need to be best friends with Elise because she sounds like a cool as shit mom (laughs) yeah for sure and you still live in minnesota maybe you can connect and be best friends yeah (laughs) i'm gonna kick you out of my best friend group nicole and i'm putting (laughs) lease in there yeah nicole will fight you uh yeah nicole will fight you i'm a burp in your face now (laughs) yep she can do it there's proof i can do it there's proof my weapon of choice (laughs) (laughs) oh my gosh so anyway that i love reincarnation stories and honestly like some of the things that like the the james laninger story like the talked about in the story like how he picked his parents um it actually reminded me of that disney movie soul that came out in 2020 have you seen that yes yep that's yes. a great movie it's yeah. so good so if if you guys haven't seen it it's really good i know it's disney but it's got jamie fox and tina fey and it's about this guy joe who's a middle school band teacher who feels unfulfilled because of his, you know, his ambition is to be a full-time jazz musician. Jazz musician? 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 I can't say musician right now. A musician. Um, And on the day he lands his biggest, uh, the biggest gig of his career, he nearly dies. And he's in a coma, but his consciousness or his soul is on another plane of existence. Um, It's like the space where souls are before they're born. And he then gets a chance to return to his body if he can figure out the purpose of life. And then just cue the wacky, wild Disney hijinks. <laughs> and it's really good. <laughs> and even the music is really good. Um, it's, the a, score, yeah, it's a good one. Did you know that the score was done by Trent Reznor and Atticus Ross? And some of the piano. I think the guy's name was John Batiste. Uh, but, like, the minute the music starts in the afterlife, like, they're like like just you can tell it's Trent Reznor or at least I can because he's done he's done some other scores um but that's really cool that Trent Reznor did all the music um and also this was like Violet's favorite movie when she's like two or three which is kind of a heavy movie for like a two or three year old I feel like a lot of Disney movies even the older ones and the newer ones are fucking dark they like are. there's like dark they're dark and heavy like 50 percent of them the parent dies yeah <laughs> just, yeah it's, even in frozen it's the deep. parents die in the boat and i'm like how yeah. do i explain this to my two-year-old what happened to the mommy and dad i know that's like thing that mark cries over he doesn't cry over any movie but the part where like the no meets the <laughs> yeah. sea and the dead oh mom God. singing <laughs> he, yeah he gets he feels like gets a little that's little an teary. emotional one <laughs> it is disney yeah I mean, like, I'm sure Violet didn't understand a lick of soul, but, like, I don't know. Something drew her to her. She even had a soul-themed birthday party. <laughs> like, it does. It feels a little more geared towards, towards adults, but, I mean, even Daniel, he was, like, bawling at the end of the movie, Soul. Mm-hmm. Was, did Mark cry at Soul, too? You know, he's a No, I guy. don't think, yeah. I don't think he's watched the whole thing. 
He hasn't watched a lot. Oh. Mark does not watch movies. Like, it's very seldom. Like, even the fact my husband's downstairs right now watching Wife Swap. <laughs> Old <laughs> episodes of Wife Swap. Um, that on. Which we were saying best, best, one of the best shows ever. And they're all on totally. Hulu now. Get up on yeah, that I love shit. It. It's so good. I love it. <laughs> um, but yeah, no, he, he hasn't watched that, but he probably would. Yeah. He doesn't yeah. have any he feelings, should. though. He's a psychopath, so I don't know. We'd have to. He might. He Rosen might. did he it might for like him. This he, if, he likes, if he likes jazzy music, he should totally watch Soul because there's so yeah. much of it in there. It's just really good. And, you know, now that I think of it, I uh, remember I actually ended up having a, a reading done on Violet. Remember we you did one for Ella? We did, yep. And it was so wild. Mm-hmm. Like. So if you've listened to any of our other episodes, you know that our girl Micah, the amazing yet retired medium, um, she did these for us and they were spot on. I mean, yeah, that was during the pandemic. Uh, so we were both like stuck inside with our wild children, essentially questioning everything, like kind of like Elise was just like falling to the floor every day. Like, yeah. What the fuck am I doing? <laughs> you're wondering if you're doing this right or doing that right. And you're parenting is good is it good enough you're doing terrible and um so yeah we both had readings done on our daughters to see if micah could sort of provide us any details on them that would kind of help us parent them better um and get to know their souls a little and man she was yeah she was spot on uh she described both of them to a t yes and i think she she was able to tune in like what their future might look like as they're like growing teenagers and adults and what they might be interested in in their future careers so i'm curious to see how that plays out nicole's daughter is gonna be super cool way cooler than my daughter and my daughter <laughs> it's like they're gonna be exact opposites just like, like didn't she are picture now. like violet didn't she say like sarah's like oh on the side of the building like, as a waitress smoking a cigarette smoking <laughs> a cigarette she goes to like art super school super alt artsy she's in a, yeah she's in a band mm-hmm. and when she's in high school it's something like that but my she kid really gets into the arts. Just gonna be it. She's straight A, going to be a doctor. A fucking scientist, doctor. Yeah. She's smart. She's didn't she say she's like the she was like like you're the the wild one in the family. Yeah. Like, yeah, I'm gonna be so crazy. Yeah. That's <laughs> but I'm the straight laced kid. <laughs> yeah. She's going to be like that. And I'm like, oh, that hundred percent makes sense. Cause I see that now. Yeah. Um, yeah, and for again, sure. she did not know anything about these girls. Like we yeah. didn't talk about our girls to Micah at all. Mm-hmm. All she got was their names, their birthdays, and like a picture of them. I think mm-hmm. that's how she could, you know, tap into their their soul energy. But... I, and I see that in both of them. Like I see it looking at Absolutely. both of them how their future could be. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yep. And for Violet, um, I don't know if you remember this, but Micah had mentioned that she doesn't really dabble in past life stuff too much, but mm-hmm. she felt really strongly that in a past life, Violet was really sort of held back from her full potential mm-hmm. um, and didn't have a whole lot of choice in her life. So it was extremely important to get her like a lot of autonomy and choices. Um, and it's actually been proven to be like extremely effective parenting method it with is. her, just like giving her tons of choices. Um, and she specifically said that Violet chose me as a mother, that she knew I would be able to give her that. So just kind of like in that other story, the kid's like, I picked you. Yeah. That's a, I thought uh, it would be perfect. Know? Yeah. Could that's a imagine... weird idea that you can pick your parents. Like, yeah. why the fuck did you pick your mother, Danielle? I hear about this a lot and it makes sense. My brother <laughs> did like this beautiful like speech about our mom and kind of it, it sounded it first like he was honoring her in a way but he says during college oh okay i was like just like at the dinner table at the dinner he's like i'm gonna say this beautiful (laughs) speech (laughs) everyone stop what you are doing (laughs) stop what you are doing and look at me this beautiful speech no it was like (laughs) this random beautiful speech but he said that like our mom was the one that he looked up to the most because it taught him what not to be okay and Mm -hmm. And I'm like, that makes sense. And I can, I mean, we're all so opposite from that. Like, we've all, like, took our, gener- like, you know, those, like, generational traumatic totally. traumas. Traumatic we, traumas. <laughs> we went Hashtag so traumatic op- traumas. Yeah, we went so weirdly <laughs> opposite and stuff. So maybe it was just our souls need to go in and be around this certain person to change it. Who knows? Yeah, you change know? the course. Break that generational trauma. That traumatic Honestly. trauma. Yeah, so who knows trauma. 
it could make sense why why I did. Ella, who knows why she would pick me if she's so straight laced, but maybe it's because she needs a little you know Maybe she was too wild. Excitement. Yeah. She was wildin' back in the day. She was crazy. Uh-huh. Which is funny because my grandma always called me the prude of the family, but she hasn't met this one yet. I was <laughs> like, just going to say, maybe maybe she's meant to teach you to dial it in a little bit. <laughs> just kidding. Don't, don't ever dial it in. <laughs> no. And again, I'm considered the prude, so. Yeah. Well, uh-huh. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> well, compared to my I, family. Um, yeah, I, so I mentioned this in another episode. Was it the last one? I don't know. They're all bleeding together now. Um, but I did have that past life, like, Akashic record yeah. reading done for myself a while back with someone other than Micah. Um, and while a lot of it felt a bit generalized, um, she did mention some things that stuck with me. Um, so she said, I don't know if you know what Akashic records are. Some people, it's, I feel like it's a newer term, but maybe mm-hmm. it's not. I don't know. Um, so she said that everybody's got Akashic records. And she said accessing our records and past lives are sort of like an internet search query. And that we can all have like an incredible countless amount of past lives. But only the ones that are relevant to the life you're living right now will sort of pop up first. Um, and I guess the ones that came to the surface for me uh, were detailing the lives in which I was always living for somebody else. And also didn't have a lot of choice in things. Um, and I mentioned this before, like she mentioned me being like a nun in a convent and she just saw a lot of head coverings, face coverings, and she linked it to having to be like modest all the time and also living in a sort of like prairie type situation um, in, in which I was having babies way too early um, and lots of them. So she was basically shown that in this life I'm meant to live for myself more to like break that mold of modesty, the generational trauma again. Um, she said she saw lots of red lipstick, which you know me. I love a red lip. Um, but yeah, it was doesn't. interesting. Who doesn't? I mean, like, if you I don't, feel just like... get the fuck out of here. That's for real. That's you don't classic. love a red lip. It is. That's classic. It is. It's classic. Classic. As Taylor Swift says, she's got that oh. red lip classic thing that you <sighs> like. She always has a sneak in a, a Swift thing. She always has That's a sneak okay. in the cult. That's okay. <laughs> I tapped into our little spooky Swifty fan base. We got so I I got oh. some Swifties in here listening to me. The occult, they know what's up. <laughs> <laughs> she is our mother, and we do what she tells us. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, I don't know. I feel like I feel like with all that past life stuff, like I even when I was young, like in like in middle school, I always felt this need sort of for something more like out of the ordinary and like non-traditional and this need to really express myself in my own way and I dyed my hair all the colors of the rainbow and I went goth and I listened to heavier music and I mean a lot of us go through this phase you did all you know all of I'm our still in phases. that phase I'm yeah. still in that phase never really got out of it uh, I'm not special by any means uh, but I don't know it just felt a little deeper than that like thinking back it's like if all this stuff is true about my past lives like it it sort of makes sense in some of the current situations that I've been in in this life like it didn't help that I was in my past relationship I was you know I was with somebody who didn't really want me doing a lot of anything I didn't have a lot of autonomy Mm -hmm. um it was pointed out if I was wearing too much makeup or if my friends were wearing too much makeup it was frowned upon if I wanted to go out with friends or if I went out with friends and I was gone too long. I was interrogated about it. Absolutely hated me. I thought I was the absolute worst. And I'm he the did. best. And I'm he the did best. He hate you. He hated most of my best friends. Yeah. But I think and that's a always thing. a bad sign. That's a, always a bad sign. If you're with someone who hates all your friends, bad sign. Red flag. I, yeah, I think it may have been may have been a jealousy thing. I don't know. Um, but it was it was really oppressive. And I lived in that for a long time. Um, and maybe the reason that I put up with it for so long is that I was still sort of stuck in that, mm-hmm. that past life trend of, of just trying to be modest and do what I was told and living for other people. Um, and I really don't mean to call this person out, so I'm not going to name any names, you know, in case they're listening. Um, but to their credit, they have done a lot of soul searching and working on themselves since then. And uh, we've had some interesting conversations and apologies were made. So I'm not trying to like talk a bunch of shit about this person <laughs> but I will. anyway boom no, I'm yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um 
But yeah, I don't know. I feel like even in the present, I sometimes have to like remind myself that I need to work harder at being like unapologetically me. Yeah. Um, and not to like get lost in the grind of the everyday monotony, which is so easy to do out here in the woods. Well, I even called you out last week. I'm like, I told you to be a bitch in a situation. I even said it. You did. I know. I need to I'm be like, that bitch. I need to be a cunt. <laughs> yep. And sometimes you just have to say it. You have to say it. So. It was. And I did. And, you know, mm-hmm. it's, you know, it was about my job and I needed more money. And I started yeah. just telling them my worth when I maybe in the past would have cowered about it. Yep. So I did that. And fuck, if I want to wear red lipstick in the middle of the woods or I'm doing dishes or going to the fucking grocery store, like, I'm going to do it. It's for do me. It. It's not for anybody else. If I want to start a podcast about being a weirdo, I'm going to finally do it. <laughs> got do this. Yeah. There, oh, I was also going to mention, last thing. There is, have you heard of Dr. Brian Weiss? No. I don't know if it's Weiss or Weiss, if you pronounce the W with a V or whatever. But mm-hmm. Okay, so there's this YouTube video by Dr. Brian Weiss. And he walks you through a meditation uh, and a past life regression session. And I've heard a lot of people... Uh, having some intense experiences with this. Um, I tried it a while mm-hmm. back, like I don't know, it was a couple months ago or last year. I don't know if it really worked for me because as mentioned before, we all know that I'm terrible at meditation. Yeah. Uh, so when he was walking me through this, it was hard to like turn my brain off. And I did see some images in my head, but it was really hard to tell if like I was putting them there, you know. But you are really good at meditating and I think you should try it and then report back to us in another episode. What happens? Yes, so put it on our post so other people can do it too. And yeah, let's see what we come back with. We will. Yes, I'll totally mm-hmm. link this video from Brian Weiss. Um, but I do have to recommend that if you do this, you should either already have YouTube Premium or sign up for the free towel to do this without mm-hmm. ads because there's nothing more startling than being in a meditative state and then hearing like, now on sale at PetSmart, <laughs> Pooper Scoopers, two ninety nine, <laughs> And you're like, oh my God, skip. Skip, yep. skip, 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 skip. <laughs> I'm all about that premium life. I'm all about, about that it. Premium life. Yeah, I'm all about do that. Do you have life. YouTube premium? I do. Oh my god! Well, give me that login too. All oh right. God. Yep. Still Jesus. on the logins. She just gives I... me all our logins. Uh, <laughs> I have it's... nothing to contribute. <laughs> <laughs> I have Disney Plus. Do you have Disney Plus? <laughs> I have that too. Why are you paying? We just combined everything. That's what you I really want. should. Until people like start kicking you off that shit, why not? That's what I'm saying. Like until that day comes, I don't give a shit. I have like four true. different families and everything. Until I'm like, until yeah. someone kicks someone off, who gives a shit? So that's true. Mm-hmm. Yep. So I'll send it over. Yeah. I'll send it over. So anyway, we're at like two and a half hours. Yeah. Here have fun editing that. this. Have fun oh editing gosh. this. I promise I'll be a lot more sober and you won't hear my crunchy diaper in the background next time. Unless I just get into wearing diapers. Maybe, like, I'll get into it again. I again. Like this was a chaotic episode. Yes. We got diapers. We got burps. We got... <laughs> yep. So, we'll... So, I apologize, but I do not apologize at the same time, so... <laughs> yeah, don't apologize. Fuck don't that. apologize. Yeah. Don't that. do it. And go on our Girls Gone Weird social media, Insta, Facebook, and then also if you have any stories, reincarnation, aliens, psychics, whatever, something you think would be really cool, send it to our Girls Gone Weird email. And then you have the 31st to get into their spooky contest, so make sure to go online Mm -hmm. and check out how you can be a part of that too. Still got a couple weeks. I am unhinged, so I am constantly, like, adding things to this giveaway. Mm-hmm. So this person's just going to get a giant box of shit that they didn't sign up for because I just want to keep giving people things. Yeah. It's my love language is giving. <laughs> uh, Another yeah, plug so for herself. Up. Another plug for herself. Uh-huh. Plug. I'm just the best. <laughs> she is the I best. Am, I am the best. Yeah. Uh, number one host. <laughs> number one. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> So please do that, and we love you guys. And please keep sharing. Yeah. Please share in the love. No negative comments. No negative. No negative. <laughs> Just well, about uh, how beautiful and hot we are, and we're so smart, and we never get anything wrong. No, and we don't say the word especially as especially, and yeah. we don't say the words library instead of library. Everything we say is right, and. <laughs> just perfect and please review all five yeah just be a good person maybe if you just be a good person like you'll reincarnate as the next taylor swift 
Yeah. Or maybe you'll reincarnate as a mosquito that I slap the shit out of on a warm summer's evening. You can you know, reincarnate as my diaper pad. Uh. Oh my god. <laughs> I a girl can dream. I know, right? <laughs> Who wouldn't dream. want that? <laughs> That's well, true. That's well, true. Oh wait, wait. I did want to say, yeah. I said this to you today mm-hmm. um, that we just um, we just started a Threads account on yes. Instagram. Um, so find us on the Threads. We're still, I'm still trying to figure out how it really works. I feel like an old person. Um, but we have uploaded all of our episodes into separate threads. So if you want to come on and like discuss things more than like the little characters you get on Instagram, like come on, let's talk about it. We're going to have one for this episode. Let's just talk. Um, we did get a little bit of feedback that, that, that quote unquote fans need somewhere to, to congregate and talk about this stuff. And they had mentioned like maybe Reddit. Like, maybe that could be your thing. Start us a Reddit. Oh, I'll start us um, a Reddit. Yep, I'll get that down. I guess some Reddit's of the people my in the chat. shit. I fucking love Reddit. Um, it is. It's my favorite. Um, yeah, let's do it. Let's have conversations. Yeah, and- we're here. We're around. We're pretending to work. We're not working. Yeah. You know. <laughs> well, that's cool we are. And we yeah. will see you next week. Yeah, let's get weird next Sunday. We're almost to Halloween. Yay. All right. Yes. Right. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye. Until next time, this has been Nicole and Denny with Girls Gone Weird. <laughs> Girls Gone Weird. Girls Gone Weird.